Welcome to the podcast dedicated to making you a faster cyclist, the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. I'm Coach Jonathan Lee. We have a different crew with us here today. We have, oh gosh, I'm going to mess it up again, Ivy. Uh, <laughs> Squid Bikes, the, can you name the <laughs> sponsors? <laughs> I mess up every time. <laughs> Panda plus the Black Bibs Racing. Yes. There's two, Ivy. Jonathan. God. <laughs> I know. Panda plus the back Black Bibs Racing, Ivy Audrain. Good to have you, Ivy. We also have Cliff Bar Racing and Trainer Road's Pete Morris. How's it going, guys? And we have our and, and Pete fresh off the vaccine. He's he's struggling through, but the show must go on because he's a pro. <laughs> and we have our CEO Nate Pearson with us. Hello. <laughs> That's actually interesting. Is Pete's so he's on his second shot. And uh, what shot did you get? Which brand? I got Moderna. Yeah. So if you go into our forum, there's a whole thread about training after getting the vaccine. And some people no issue. Some people. They feel like Pete and then some people, huge issues. But, uh, anyways, I, I've read through a lot of that because, uh, I'm on my way to getting my second shot too. And I think all of us, we want to plan our workouts around it. Right. We want to know, are we out for three mm -hmm. days or is it yeah. like, can I train light the next day? I think in general, everyone who who's getting it, just plan not to do a really hard workout the next day. Don't have your like huge VO two max. If you're going to have anything, have it easy. And if you do feel bad, just rest. Yeah. I'm kind of planning. I'm actually planning on it's perfect. My rest week falls on when I get my second shot, uh, not next week, but the week after. So hoping I'm gonna be that dramatic and well. say plan to not walk or move after <laughs> your shot. Be like a plan builder thing, like put in yeah, like your yeah. shot dates yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and adapt your training around it. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. So if you're joining us right now on YouTube, thank you. You can give us a thumbs up. If you're listening on the podcast, thank you. And you can also share and rate that podcast or our podcast on whichever platform you're on. And we really appreciate that. That's a huge way to help us. You can also listen to the Science of Getting Faster podcast. You can listen to the Successful Athletes podcast. And we have just an awesome uh, podcast network here. Go to the blog, do all that stuff, our YouTube channel and get faster. Uh, new mobile apps. If you haven't checked recently, you should definitely open up the mobile app and, and update it. So uh, iOS and Android, it's incredible. Way to go, Pete. You were the, the lead product manager on that. And yeah. uh, just congratulations. That was a big <laughs> lift and you did a lot of work on it. So I'm, I'm really glad to have it out and have, have it in everybody's hands. That, that's pretty satisfying. And people are stoked, which makes me happy. For sure. Nate, do we have any job postings we should talk about? We do have two React React Native, but also a new one, C Sharp, um, that is working on backend data stuff. Uh, pretty cool job. Uh, we get asked a lot about C Sharp posting, so this is it. It's up and it is uh, anywhere. So just you just have to overlap with the US time. I think what we say is like, I forgot, it says in job posting, but not a ton. You could be in Europe and I think it would work. So mm -hmm. there you go. Awesome. Uh, Australia is a little bit tough though, because then you have to wake up so early to have overlap that it can be yeah. very hard to go Australia unless you're a very early person, but don't set yourself up for that kind of failure to wake up at like four in the morning or something. If you're a person who likes to wake up at nine, that's yeah. a miserable life. That'd be tough. Uh, adaptive training update. We've added more people this week and continue to do so. And we're continuing to make tweaks and improvements. It's exciting stuff. Uh, we have some questions. We'll probably cover this every week as we get more questions and people asking more commonly a certain set of questions. We'll try to address them on the podcast to help people out. Cole specifically says, uh, and Nate, Nate, you can answer these ones, but uh, Cole says, while anxiously awaiting to get added to the beta for adaptive training, I've been wondering if I can use adaptive training through the train now feature before getting added to the beta since it uses adaptive trainings technology. So let me explain. If I look at my prescribed workouts for the week and see that my next workout is a 60 minute VO2 max workout, could I go to train now and replace the prescribed VO2 max workout with the one it recommends for me and thus get some of the AT benefit before getting into the beta? Okay. Answer is sort of, kind of, there's two things to think about. One is that train now does not follow the same workout profile that's on your plan for that specific part. So <laughs> train now might be, uh, in climbing is special or sweet spot, but if you might be in a specific part of, you know, leading up to your a race and over unders are really important, you could be served a sweet spot workout rather than over unders. And that's going to be very different. Although it could be the, the right, uh, intensity for you. So you got to think about that. So you could, if you're trying to use it that way, you could look for the same profile. Same with um, VO2 max. It could be, you know, low sustained VO2 max, like 108. It could be 120% three minute, like killers, or it could be on offs. Those are three different types of workout profiles. And depending on where you are in your season, what kind of racing you are doing, uh, AT and, and plans would give you the right workout. 
uh, train now is more of a variety and you can kind of click through and say, Hey, I want to, I feel like doing this or this today. And that's very important for motivation. Uh, next is inside of train. Now you can't see this yet unless you're on the beta, but there are, it serves both achievable and productive workouts. So we define productive workout as a workout that is one level above your current level anywhere in there. So if you're level five, it's like a 5.2 will be productive. 5.5 will be productive, but it will also serve you a four or a three, which is, that's not a bad thing. Like it's impossible to always like step forward one every time. I think everyone here at trainer road understands that <laughs> I've tried that. <laughs> yes. It does not work. It ends in um, flames. Yeah. <laughs> um, maybe if, I mean, too, uh, we're looking at different rates of increasing for like, uh, on how early you are in your training. Because if you're just starting and you're at, <clears throat> sorry, 1.5 watts per kilo, that rapid increase, increase, like it happens for people. But John and Pete, you've been training, and Ivy too, you guys have all been training for years and years and years. And that idea of that linear stepped, like, it's like, it's just like weight training at 10 pounds every week. When you're a beginner, you can do that. But then when you get to be really strong, you can't do it anymore and you have a big history. So what you could be served is a easier workout an achievable workout. And that doesn't mean it's easy. It just means instead of like a very hard, it's a hard. And that might change your rate of progression that an AT would give you in a plan, but it doesn't necessarily make it bad. So really you could, um, I don't think you're gonna, we're kind of slicing hairs, splitting hairs here, slicing hairs, splitting hairs, um, cutting hairs. Uh, that's the wrong <laughs> word too, but, <laughs> um, we're doing rocket surgery. There could be yeah. some. <laughs> there, uh, I don't know. You could. It, it doesn't hurt. I, yeah. This is a hard answer because there's there's benefits for both ways. And mm -hmm. um, how about this? If you truly like the train now workout more, I would just do it and you'd be good. Yeah. But you're not going to get the, the plan will be better in the future. But yeah, if you like you're the not other gonna... one and it's good, it's good too. For sure. It's a big enough. This isn't, uh, this isn't you doing that will not replicate the adaptive training experience that it won't do. However, yes. it might give you fun workouts that could be good. Um, they're going to be within your bandwidth for sure, which is exciting. Okay. Next question. How does adaptive training know how to develop my needed strengths? Okay. So this is your needed strengths. It's so, uh, it's based on what your a race is or what kind of like, what kind of ride or racing you put in, because if you're a triathlete, your strengths are going to be different than a crit racer, right? Um, so based on those, that's how we know what energy systems you should use in that race or what kind of riding you're going to use, um, how punchy you need to be versus how good your endurance needs to be. And that's how it knows because what your, what your goals are, for instance, Pete, his strength is on off hard, like racing in a crit. But if Pete goes, I want to do a Ironman. We're not going to be like, yep. okay, Pete, we're going to further develop your on off hard racing. <laughs> like that's, you know, it's a strength. We have to develop, we have to develop his endurance all day, get his like burning ton of fat, be able to be an arrow for a long time, uh, with running swims and just have a and miserable time for like yeah, 12, 13 hours. <clears throat> imagine that sounds Pete really, racing, really hard. Imagine Pete racing Kona, the whole bike split with 30 thirties, just like, yeah. just like <laughs> <laughs> the whole way. It's just how make it go it. by way faster. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually, it's, here's the trick. You're only working half the time that way. Right, Pete. Yeah. There you go. Uh, you'd so, only be pedaling science. 66 miles of that. It's like a Spanish needle <laughs> all the way out. You would kill like other triathletes too. Cause the rules when you pass, if you pass, they have to drop back you would like pass yeah. they drop back and they would just disrupt your, like, the whole he would just have a line of like a thousand athletes stuck behind him just angry and frustrated they oh, didn't really change the rules if, if somebody did that because it would just someone in the pro field should do that just like mess up the race and be like these rules are silly uh, <laughs> uh, be amazing sorry nate i threw you off <clears throat> No, that was it. That's all good it. on that one. Cool. Next one. Will the system get confused if I take a break to stretch, fill bottles, et cetera, during a workout, then we can address this next one. Yeah. So, uh, depends on when you do it. So if you are in the middle of a three minute VO two max interval and you're like, I need to stretch and you stop <laughs> and you stretch, like we're going to count that as a, uh, Hey, you didn't do that interval as prescribed, but if you're in a rest period between sets and you stretch, you get off, you go to the bathroom, that's perfectly fine. And that was specifically like, I, I pee a lot when I ride. 
So that had to be in there, right? I don't want to, I don't want to get, and even endurance rights, I don't want to have it say, hey, you failed the workout or you struggled with it because I have to go to the bathroom. But if you're in a 30-30 and you, you know, stretch in the middle of a 30-30 uh, and you skip one of those or you pause the workout and extend it. So you, let's say you have 15 30-30s. Um, that's a lot, but let's say you do. Uh, and, you, and you take a break in there, we'll count that as like, uh, as if you were kind of skipping those intervals because it was too intense. Um, and you can always, you know, override at the end, but that's the, that's how it is. So it, basically if you're not in a set, you're fine. But if you're in a set, don't stretch in the middle of a 10 minute threshold interval. Yeah. yeah Nate, it's can alid- you speak to oh, sorry, the, yeah. the weight of your post workout survey versus the actual like ride data of taking a pause, like how they contribute to your adaptation? Yeah. So those, both of those, so they're different stuff. There's the, uh, quantitative of how we score your workout and then the qualitative and the only way to, well, they're both taking into account for AT. There's never like a, uh, one or the other besides, um, we're going to talk about like a device issue or saying, I didn't fail this workout. The other stuff you say, Hey, I didn't eat well. Well, we still want to know, Hey, you struggle with this workout, but Hey, this person didn't eat well, which that's going to have, um, a different impact than if you were to say, uh, it was too intense for me, which has a different impact saying that, Hey, I'm getting sick. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's kind of both of those combined. And then as we learn, um, more stuff, those, the, uh, the, the, what is it? Not the interaction between the two will, yeah. Adapt and change, adapt, will adapt and change based on what we learn moving forward. If that, so I, I don't. Well, we want to be very um, careful in, in messaging that we don't exactly describe how it works today because tomorrow it could be different and the next day it could be different. So mm-hmm. if we've done that before in the forum and stuff, and it's already changed, right? Because we get more data, things come in, uh, and either it's we either get data and then like a um, algorithm changes, or we get data and that goes into machine learning and then that updates. And that's kind of the whole idea of here is like the, the constant improvement of. Um, stepping forward and getting better and better and better. What about if you have so, a mechanical problem? Yeah. So let's say you are in the mechanical or device issue. Let's say you're in the middle of a 10 minute interval and your chain breaks or you run out of batteries. Um, that is one where you're going to want to put at the end. What, uh, is that funny? I was, I was, I was making funny gestures on the camera. I'm, I apologize. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I, did I do an accidental joke? Cool. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> at the end of the survey, if we say, hey, you struggle with that workout, you can say, I had a device issue and mechanical too, you could put the same thing or I didn't fail this workout. And then that will then say, okay, well, we're going to either count that as, um, I think then we have a survey that asks you how hard it was. Like it acts like you did pass it. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. So that's, that's what happens. Cool. And then the last question about adaptive training, how frequent are adaptations made? Um, well, it depends on what data comes in, but every time you have data come in or you have surveys, we check. So the check happens a whole bunch of times. Um, and it might be happening, uh, even on, a, I think, uh, it's not every day. It's more like when you visit, we'll then check to see past cause that's easier for our server. So if you don't train for two weeks, we don't have to check every day. It's you come in and then we do the check when you look and how the results of that it could be an adaptation every day, or it could be no adaptation, uh, depending on what you do. It could be multiple who, who knows, um, mm-hmm. that's the, so often. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> as often as you have an input, right? So, uh, yeah. let's go into Holly's question. She says, and this one now it doesn't have to do necessarily with adaptive training, even though we have joked before that, like basically the podcast disappears after adaptive training is out because it answers every question, but just the same from Holly. She says, as of July, 2020, I'm a new road bike rider. Thanks to the joys of 2020. It's been super fun to translate my long distance running fitness into cycling. And as a youngish petite woman, I just love that I am now easily passing tall male riders on the road. I have many questions and feel that we could do a full podcast together. So first of all, way to go, Holly. Uh, that's awesome. Just yeah. smashing egos left and right. Um, that's, that's cool. Uh, then you say, uh, however, to keep it functional, I downloaded trainer road and have been doing RPE based workouts as I don't have a power meter or indoor trainer, which is actually something that we probably don't talk enough a lot or talk about enough 
if you don't have an indoor trainer, indoor training isn't feasible. Like you're in an apartment and it would just be too loud, right? Or any number of different things and you don't have a power meter, you can still follow your training plan with RPE based uh, power targets. So you won't have, you know, do X watts. Instead, it'll be do seven out of 10 for this amount of time. Uh, you'll still get a, a quality training experience, right? Now, if you want to step it up even more, then you can get power measurement and everything else. But so kudos, Holly, on doing that. That's awesome. She says, I was just promoted into leadership of my company and suspect that my outdoor training will be compromised for a while. Congratulations. She says, so thinking of going in for an indoor trainer. So first, do you have any trainer gear recommendations and best practices I should be cognizant of? And then second question I have been dying to ask. I have two large active dogs that I need to walk for at least 90 minutes every day, including rest days. This is part of my activity baseline for five years. However, I have heard you all talk about the need to really rest on rest days. So am I disrupting my recovery? Thanks so much for your podcast and product. It has really helped me jump into this sport, which I am absolutely loving. Cheers from Holly. So uh, equipment levels first. We've talked about this plenty of times before, but uh, virtual power, power meter, and smart trainer are usually kind of like the three tiers that, that you can kind of jump into getting started with training with power. Uh, Nate, can you describe what virtual power is for people? Yeah, virtual power. So back in the day, like 2010, when I started coding this, maybe launched in 2011, uh, not everyone had power meters. And power meters were expensive back then. I don't know if you remember, like it was easy <laughs> to have like a $2,000 power meter. And, uh, what we did is we took all the trainers that we could get our hands on in the market and we put a power meter and we had somebody ride at different wattages. And that did is we could develop a power curve saying at this certain speed, this is the wattage that you would get out. And what, what happened is you, you, you develop this curve, but then the, um, where that lands on the Y axis, kind of like the offset of the Y axis would be different based on rolling resistance, but rolling resistance is pretty stable. So what this allowed us to do with virtual power is if you keep your tire pressure the same and the tension of the drum on the tire, we could develop this curve where you would get repeatable power numbers, but because we're not measuring the rolling resistance and that can change a lot with how tight it is, it's not the same as a power meter where it'd be, um, accurate, but it could still be precise as every time you did it, it was the same. So let's say it would put Pete at maybe, let's say 250 watts instead of 350. But if Pete was always 250 and he went in and he could then progress, that would be great. It's just, you can't compare it to other people and you get a kind of an ego hit usually if you go from virtual power to a power meter or a boost. I've seen it both ways where you thought you were really strong and then you're like, oh shoot, I'm not strong. So that's virtual power. But it's cheap yeah. though. It's like, you just get a speed sensor. So like a $20 speed sensor rather than a $2,500 power meter. Yep. And then I'd say power meter is probably, if you had to pick power meter between smart trainer, I'd probably pick power meter. What, what do you, what say you, uh, Ivy on that one? Well, I think that Holly just doesn't want to get in a situation where, I mean, I, it sounds like with their promotion, they're still going to want to ride outside, but maybe just less, but you just don't want to get in a situation where like you have two sets of workouts and like one of them is missing the data that you wish you had. And that can really, I know for me that has impeded workouts at times when like I'm in one setup, I have data and have information to go off of and the other I'm writing RPE. It's hard to like hit the same marks and be motivated. So I would recommend for a power meter, getting something that would give you like the most bang for your buck that you can have both indoors and outdoors. So it might not be a smart trainer. It may be, you know, and Holly may have two bikes, like two setups, like something mm. that stays on the trainer and like stays inside and something else that's outside. So having something that maybe can be used in both scenarios would be most effective for, for training and for peace of mind. And yeah. So I really like those new Garmin pedals because like you said, the versatility, I know that like Favero Asiomas exist and that sort of thing, but being able to swap effectively, you could swap that those pedals from road, even over to mountain bike or a cross bike or a gravel bike or anything like that. But versatility really does matter because once you have power once, like you don't want to ride without it. Like I have power on my enduro bike and honestly, I'm never going out and doing structured workouts on my enduro bike but I feel like I, I do want to know the impact of that ride after I've done it right on like, what's how, what's the impact on my training and without power, I can guess, and I can probably get close, but it's just nice peace of mind to have. Yeah. So for Holly, um, for adaptive training that having the power meter on both will be better, but it really depends. So if you're like a 
two workout a week on the weekdays, and then I'm just going to ride for fun with my friends. You don't really need a power meter in this situation. But if you're saying I'm going to mix my workouts, some indoor, some outdoor, then I would go for the power meter. But if it's just casual outside and there's no, <laughs> you want to be the Sounds like Holly like, likes I got to an interval. roll coal when she goes outside. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> She's taking names. <laughs> I think Holly yeah. needs power meter. <laughs> For sure. And then if you go smart trainer, the other option there, uh, once again, you only have power inside. And this is something that we've said plenty of times. And, and I feel like it's, it's good to explain it though. If you're going to go smart trainer, I feel like it's, if you're going to spend that money, in other words, I feel like it's best to get one of the top tier trainers because so there's two things with the trainer. There's that, how the trainer actually works. And in other words, how it feels when you're pedaling, like, is the resistance, is it, does it feel smooth or does it feel like you're pedaling through chunky peanut butter all the time? Uh, does it ramp up in a really strange way that just feels completely unrealistic and foreign? So then when you get out on the road, it feels strange, or does it represent what you feel when you're on the road? And this is a good example. If people are cost constrained and looking for an indoor trainer, I usually push them toward the kinetic road machine because it just feels so good in that regard. It's like one of the best trainers, right? It doesn't have resistance control, but you as a rider have built in resistance control as well. It's just, you adjust your cadence and shift gears, right? And you can hit your targets. So a lot of the time, a lower end smart trainer, it's, you have resistance control, but it's paired to a trainer that doesn't perform as well in terms of how it feels. So then you'll have smart control, but it's always on kind of like a marginalized experience. So that's why we usually recommend if you're going to get a smart trainer, you go for that top tier. So we're talking like, you know, the, the top one from tax, like the tax Neo top one from Saris, the H3, that sort of a thing like that level is what you want to be looking at with those. Um, Pete, what, what, what say you on that? You deal with a lot of devices in particular. With yeah, I, apps. I would say, uh, one of the interesting things about, uh, trainers is that they always make sacrifices to make them cost less. I mean, just as a, from a basic business standpoint. So you have to remember that, that they're making some sort of sacrifice to make it at a lower price point. And generally speaking, everything feels better at the top end, which is a lot, but, uh, one of the final things that is really important to do is there's a lot of kind of trainer specific um, information that you should do to optimize your experience. So just putting your bike on and clicking through the gears and going works. But if you if you kind of optimize your setup and if uh, actually if you go to the um, help center on trainer road and look up your trainer, there's a huge article on all the best practices you should do, which gear you should be in. Um, how to set everything up when the, when the calibration, you know, everything that you need to know to make your experience much better. So no matter what trainer you're on, definitely do that. And you'll be surprised at how it can change your experience. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was just at Ikea and I bought some stuff and then it broke like two <laughs> days later, Ikea. but it just feels <laughs> different. You oh, love do you it, give me then... balls? No, I, oh, my, oh. my dad's actually like Swedish and we get real Swedish meatballs. This is Ooh. like, it's like, it's like Taco Bell, right? Uh, of food. <laughs> hey, there's a place for Taco Bell. <laughs> there's totally a place, but it's just not the same. It's like, I don't go there just for that. Um, but it's, so the IKEA stuff's nice, but after a while you're like, oh, I wish I'd have to buy it again. Right. Uh -huh. And if you are the type of person who you're like, this is, I'm going to be on this trainer every day, right. For an hour or two hours or multiple times a week. This is a huge part of my life. And I really want to, um, do this and have a good experience. I would save up the extra two or 300 to get that extra level. Another tip I love, unless it's the, the road machine is really good, but if you're going to get a smart trainer, the, uh, wheel off where yeah. you get to put mm -hmm. the chain on it, you will save a tire. Like you got to think about that. The tire that gets worn down on a, mm -hmm. uh, on one that's not that, that, that is a cost for sure. And that will then after you use it for a couple of years. That's a good $200 of tires that you could eat through easy, um, mm -hmm. or more. And then, or you could get like a, a special wheel with one of the orange, you know, the, the trainer, the trainer tires. tires, but then that's also more money and more setup and you have to change it all the time. Um, that's what I think. And I'm not saying all the, the other trainers are going to break or something, <coughs> but there is a difference as Pete said, mm -hmm. it's the, the, Probably the trainer companies love us saying this too, because there's probably more margin on the higher trainers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah it's the most expensive thing. <laughs> yeah, for but yeah, sure. It's, it's great. Yeah, and the other benefit that you get with the wheel off ones and the higher end models in particular is you get more flexibility with like through axles, 
or with normal road axles. If you have an older bike that you want to put on there and even like drivetrain stuff, whereas you could maybe swap the free hub. So you could run like a SRAM XD driver, maybe this new, new Shimano micro spline driver or something like that might not be accessible on a lower end smart trainer as well. So um, there's a lot of things to keep in mind. I have to say this too, because Ivy is going to get, uh, this question a ton because everyone will want to read is just keep your chain line straight. Um, I like mm -hmm. being a big gear on the trainer. If you're in a small gear and you have lower speed, the trainer will actually have an easier time of like adjusting the power very, very quickly. I find with the new power match, that's not even an issue. I'm in like a big 53, 11 or 12. I, I like the, the big, the high inertia feel. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, uh, after the, if you do not have a power meter after the warm up, then do your spin down. Because mm -hmm. you want your trainer to warm up. If you do have a power meter, you do not need to uh, do a spin down of your trainer if you're using power match, which is on by default, because that's because your power meter drives it. Um, and then for your power meter, you can zero that before you get on, and that's enough for the whole ride. You don't have to worry about anything else. Boom, no mm -hmm. notes needed, Pete. Boom. That's that's amazing. Amazing. I'm, I'm very <laughs> proud. <laughs> you would have had Let's so go. many questions, Ivy. You know it. I know. <laughs> for Thank <sure>. you. <laughs> you're welcome. Let's get into our question about recovery. Pete, you have, uh, you have Nova, your pup, and you're always mm. taking her out for walks and everything else, uh, or dog, mm -hmm. I should say, she's not yeah. a pup anymore. Uh, how do you manage that? Because you take her out regularly for walks, but then training work, busy life. Yeah. Uh, I think, uh, it's enjoyable in the sense that it is not training or work or regular life things. So there's something to be said for a recovery walk that is more for you or the dog or whoever. Um, so that, that shouldn't be discounted. Um, but I think for most people, unless you're really at the high end of your total stress that you can handle as a person, um, I would say a dog walk, isn't going to, um, diminish your ability to train or uh, tackle new things. Um, so think about how, how you feel on a daily basis. If you're barely struggling through your workouts and every time you get up, you feel lethargic and then you have to do a 90 minute dog walk, I would say the dog walk may actually be impacting you. Um, but if you feel pretty good most of the time and you're getting enjoyment and the dogs are getting enjoyment, I would say it's totally valid and works really well. Um, walking is, is a lot less stress on your body than you would think, especially if you're used to doing it all the time. Mm -hmm. Ivy, you mentioned that you, you knew of like pro riders that intentionally took walks sans dog. They just <laughs> took walks as like part of their, as part of their program. Right. Yeah. A couple, um, world tour guys that I know, like even during stage races and like grand tours, like every night take like a 30 minute walk, um, because it's good to like get away from your team setting and like do something different other than riding. And there are a lot of like good cognitive benefits to, to just like walking for a few minutes alone. Um, but yeah, so it, it doesn't have to be taxing all the time, but on the other side of this, um, it can be one of my like weird, odd jobs during pro road racing was being a dog walker, which <laughs> was, um, some days it was really like too much, like too hard to do a 90 minute walk, like not a chance, no way after a hard workout. And so one of my hacks was, um, Holly should get a hucket, you know, one of those like oh, yeah. catapult the stick on ball, ball tosser. Things. So you just lean against a fence and just, you know, wear your dog out. <laughs> Take zero effort. It's great. Or if your dog is super well socialized, like I would take my, the dogs I walk to um, a dog park and just like sit down and eat a sandwich and recover and let the dogs get tired. Like Ivy, Ivy brings out the Norma tech booth to the dog park yeah. and just like, like <laughs> snaps on out. a chair. Yeah. 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 Up. I was hoping for the treadmill. We just put them on the yeah. treadmill and have them run. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Not the same experience for a dog, sadly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I've found that I, I, my dogs admittedly get much longer walks and much more frequent walks if it's during recovery weeks and off season. Like when it's in, if I was doing mid volume, I could manage more. But as I'm doing high volume, that's taking up a whole lot more of my available stress space, so to speak. As a result, that extra time on my legs and everything else, I do feel it. Uh, I don't want to feel it, 
I want to just be able to spend all that time walking the dogs, do all that stuff. But I, I, I do feel it. So, but, but the thing is there's two sides of this. Number one, if you're not used to walking your dogs for 90 minutes and suddenly you start walking your dogs daily for 90 minutes, that will feel like an increase in stress. Now you mentioned <clears throat> Holly, that this is like your baseline. You've done this for years. So you're probably used to that. So the other end is then what Pete's talking about is how, like, how full is the glass or is it already almost to the very brim so that it's almost overflowing? A 90 minute walk is going to have an impact, but if you have some room before you fill up that glass of stress, so to speak, then you're probably okay. Nay, I'm sorry. I cut you off. You were going to say something. No, you didn't. Okay. Oh. <laughs> I mean, if that's the measurement, then everyone cuts me off all the time because I always <laughs> want to say something, but I'm trying to work on not saying things as quickly. Uh, Holly, absolutely walk your dogs five years, 90 minutes for five years. This is the, think of this as a, uh, cortisol lowering event. Like mm -hmm. to, in the evening or in the morning, what it is, you walk, you relax, cortisol, like the stress in your body, that's a huge toll on people as for recovery. And you get in that parasympathetic state of like, you can think about your intention for the next day. You could write things down as you walk, as things come into your brain, because you're not, there's not like stimulus coming in, right? You're with your dogs, you come back then you're really ready to relax. And I don't think if you, you're adapted to it, 90 minutes for every day for five years, it's no issue. That's like me saying, should I really walk from my car to my office? Like I'm kind of I'm up with my stuff. Like I've been doing it for my lifetime, but it might be too much. Um, I think you're going to be fine, Holly. And uh, yeah, just, I think you would be worse not doing it actually, because then you would probably stress about your dogs. Mm -hmm. uh, you wouldn't have that like decompression time and you'd be too focused, which we see all the time, right? With, with people, you get too tied up in the details. Like, oh, this, that's five more grams of, of fat than I wanted in this meal. Oh my goodness. My whole thing's gone. And the stress of that and worrying is the thing that makes you slower, which totally. is crazy. Not that, not the action you're doing or not doing. It's the <laughs> stress that does it. So don't worry, Holly, you are good. Yeah, for sure. Jay's question. He says, Hey, I'll love the product and love the podcast. And actually, before we go any further in Jay's question for everybody that's joining us live on YouTube, you can send in questions. And I think this week, I think we might actually, uh, have some time to handle the live questions. So, uh, it's already start submitting them. And then, uh, hopefully what we can do is have Jesse or any of the copywriters that are in the live chat right now, they can toss those into the doc for us. So, okay. Getting back into Jay's question, love the product and love the podcast. I have two family members with compromised immune systems in my household. So I decided that I would forego all riding with friends, teammates, and racing until they and I were fully vaccinated. They have now been fully vaccinated, and I am a month away from having my second dose of the vaccine take full effect. So after this, I'm hoping to get back into gravel, road, and crit racing when races start this summer. Unfortunately, because I won't have ridden with anyone for over a year, I'm concerned about my bike handling capabilities and upcoming races. Uh, Jay, you and everybody else listening to this podcast as well. <laughs> we yes. all feel that way. Uh, so he says, do you have any advice on easing back into the group, into group rides and workouts without causing cat five, like catastrophes? I really don't want to be that guy. Thanks for all the help you can, uh, you can provide on this one. So yeah, happy to Jay. Pete, do you want to kick us off on this one? Uh, yeah. we, we had a long discussion about it. Yeah, actually this is, this is pretty poignant Jay, because I just raced on Saturday and, uh, I was super rusty. Uh, all things felt really bad. I couldn't, I turned my bicycle and I was like, this is wrong. And there's people around me and it was scary. Um, and so even though I think I'm a pretty good bike handler, most of the time, uh, it's, if it, if you don't do it, it goes away. It's just like anything else. Like, um, so it was, it was definitely very uncomfortable. I was bad at the beginning of the race and I got better over the course of the race, but, um, it, it wasn't familiar and I felt bad. Uh, so everybody else is going to be in that same boat. We, we were talking about it kind of around during the race and everybody felt that like the cobwebs were really hard on there. Some people hadn't raced in 18 months or, you know, almost two years. A couple of us raced like 14 months ago. Um, so it's, it's a long time to not be in a situation that you used to be familiar with. And it's already something that really pushes you mentally and physically. Um, it's way beyond the limit for most people. So remind yourself that you're doing something very crazy when you're riding around at 25 or 30 miles an hour, six inches away from someone's, someone else's handlebars. Um, because that's scary. And that, there's a reason your brain doesn't like to, for you to do it. Um, and so it, it shuts back down. Um, but I would say as soon as you got back into it, as soon as like, uh, the first 
five minutes go away, your body starts remembering. Uh, um, and it starts coming back pretty quickly. Uh, one of the things that I noticed is some of the stuff, some of the things that I, while I was racing came back more quickly than others. Um, so like the, the actual like lines through the corner came back pretty quickly. Um, because that's something kind of less, uh, less about other people. Um, I guess more for me, people sort of stay out of my way a little more. I'm, I'm not really sure why. Um, but I can, like, I can take as long as dude you're there. Massive, can't imagine. Glowing <laughs> blonde hair, <laughs> <laughs> your reputation, the cliff kit. <laughs> There's a lot of reasons. Uh, Pete. <laughs> well, so I would say that one of the things that was, that came back pretty quickly. Um, but I had a really hard time staying on wheels, uh, from a, like, a putting a lot of extra effort. I hadn't, I hadn't dug very deep in a long time, apparently, because it felt very hard. Um, <laughs> and like dropping wheels, uh, was way more difficult and I couldn't wrap my head around it and I couldn't, I, I never got it over the course of the day. So that's a good example where the corning came back, but I, while I was racing, I was trying to recognize what wasn't coming back and remove myself out of those situations, mm -hmm. uh, because things are going to come back at a different rate. And so there's stuff that you can check off and say, all right, I'm okay with touching elbows with someone again, that feels fine, but I really don't want someone to take the inside line. Like I'll, I'll give up places rather than get the inside line and get spooked and give up, you know, mm. 10 wheels. Can so, you explain which, can you explain, <laughs> can you explain what you mean by uh, dropping wheels, Pete? So, um, one of the things in a crit race, you kind of have this freedom of movement, uh, for the surrounding uh, racers around you. Um, and so what you can do is you can give up space in a straightaway or through a corner or something like that. And what you do is you guess how much space you can give up over the course of the next five seconds or something. And the more accurate you, uh, predict how hard people are going to pedal, the closer you'll be to their wheel, um, with slightly less work. So what you really want to do is predict how, how long they're going to pedal hard for and how soon they're going to slow down and you can kind of meet them in the middle and pedal not quite so hard and slow down a little less and run into the back of them. And so my, uh, my finger in the wind for dropping wheels was way off. I was just drop. I was, I was like 10 or 15 feet off the back of every corner. And I was like, man, this is still not working. And then try to pedal harder next time. And I think it was m mostly fitness. Honestly, I just didn't want to make the effort because I could tell I was going to blow up. Um, so I had to dial it back and then hope that they slowed down more than they did. And it didn't work. The opposite of what Pete just said is where there's a gap and you think, oh, the, the, they're, it's going to surge even more and you really accelerate and then the whole, everyone slows down and you have to break into them. That's the, oh. that's the worst. And <laughs> well, if you can time it, like Pete said it, you can just kind of like, you, you probably save like 20%. That's what it feels yeah. like where you, where you just kind of float back and forth a little bit because you're never hitting the brakes into it, into them. Um, but you're also not experiencing the huge spikes because a lot of times in a crits, they accelerate and then slow down immediately, right? Mm -hmm. And Pete's talking about smoothing it out. And if there's a little bit of a gap, that little smooth can kind of, it gives you a buffer. It's just like in traffic, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. When everyone, if there's a little, like if you, if you leave like seven car lengths, that's too much for cycling, but <laughs> obviously, um, <laughs> then you could, you don't have to have the, the brakes and stuff, but if you ride right on somebody, you have to stop right away and you, you then have to accelerate when they accelerate and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, there's an assumption that you always need to stay within X distance of a person's wheel, yep. but, and that will make you a very tired cyclist <laughs> if you yes. do that. And also it makes for a lot of dangerous scenarios. That, that is so true. Especially when I started, uh, when I started racing like a lot two years ago, I guess it was two years ago now. Yeah. Cause last year I didn't race, mm -hmm. um, the, uh, everyone would be like, you can't drop the wheel. You can't drop the wheel. You gotta be up front the whole time. Those are two um, conventional wisdom things about you have to be at the front and you can't drop the wheel, which I think just lead to a tired rider. And I, I would do the opposite. I'd let the people flow through. I didn't stay at the front. I, I had gaps and like, I let it accordion and just kind of try to float. And then when it slowed down, this is what people would always say when it would bunch, I would just boop, coast to the front. Hey, I'm at the front now with zero effort. Mm -hmm. Right. And then at the, at the end of the race, when it really mattered, that's when I used all my effort because I didn't have any, um, I wasn't tired. So yeah. I could really use the power at the last four or five laps, get to the front or even sometimes mm -hmm. less than that. Because as you see in those race videos, Pete saw it with analyzing like two laps to go and everyone would be like, whoop, slow down. It's like, yeah. okay, you're yeah. automatically at the front. Now there's the whole time you could have battled and people say that because of safety, but it's also, you can be safe tail gunning, um, 
Totally. I think that's the safest actually, because you can mm -hmm. really see crashes and you can see what's going on. And as the field slows down, you can really see it ahead of time and it's easier to save energy. It's only hard to tail gun, like Pete said, if you drop it on the corner and then they kill it, <laughs> then you're like yes. by yourself yeah. and that's no good. Then nope. you gotta be in the right mindset to race like that though. Like it's so hard to go into like a high intensity, like high stress race and be like, it's okay, man. I'll like, I'll like, let, I'll close that gap in the corner, man. Like it's really hard to go. It is, especially like if you're trying to tail gun and like stay near the back or like in the middle to conserve energy and people around you in that setting can sometimes be frantic and like get mad at you and be like, well, why can't you hold the wheel? Like it's hard Ooh. to, it's hard to, which is, yeah, something that I've experienced. Like it's hard to like be rest assured that what you're doing is right and not might not be what the writers around you are doing, but know that like, it's going to work out in the end. Can we talk about that person really quick? Cause all of us have been that person at some point, or we have seen that person in a race and like interact with that person. Yeah. So people the, say that to me. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The, the person that, that's like, don't drop You're letting gaps open up. Don't drop that wheel. Why are you doing that? The reason That's, just th like, if we take a step back and think about it, like actually go ahead, Ivy, like, why are they even saying that? What, what's your read on the situation? Yeah. So that's an experience that I've most commonly, uh, dealt with when racing with men. And the reason that I race that way when I race with men is because I'm, I'm not like when I jump into a pro one, two men's crit, like I'm not on the same level as those guys. And so I have to race that way. Otherwise I won't. I won't make it till the end, you know, and that's my goal ultimately is just to like, just to stick around. Um, and so by racing that way, the men and people that I race with in that stage of the race that are like, kind of in that, like lower middle to like back, they're not racing the same way. They're not like staying back there to conserve. Like there may be a few like really smart guys that are back there that are racing that way. But most of the people that are back there racing that way are frantic and anxious and don't want to be at the back and can't figure out how to move up. And they get really frustrated that I'm opening gaps and then like closing them through the corner. They see me making space and they can't compute that that space is okay. And that it's going to be closed. And, um, mm -hmm. they get mad and lash out and yell and like, can you just hold the wheel? And like, um, <laughs> it's really hard to like see that anxious, nervous energy and even like see some physical aggression from it and like see them dive in and like, they, you know, it's hard to like, see that and experience it and be like, it's okay. Like, this is the way I'm racing. Like I know how to do this. Like, and usually they end up getting dropped a couple laps later anyways. Yes. It's that they're, they're worried. That's why they're saying it. Right. And, and winners don't look for people to blame for excuses. However, that is absolutely looking for, you're going to make me and everybody else lose if you do this. And it's like, actually you could solve your own problem with this. Like, like you can fill in the gaps. You can position yourself better. You can read the race better or, you know, do any of the uh, many things that a racer could do to be able to be more efficient in the group. If you look at the front of the group, the front of the group is not the one, they are not saying, why are you letting that gap open up? They are not doing that. The ones that are strategically managing the race and doing their job, they know that, Hey, if this person's opening up gaps, that's fine. We, uh, we adjust for that and we can change that around. Uh, it's always the guy in the breakaway that's terrified that he's going to get dropped out of the breakaway. He's going to be the one yelling at you about closing or about letting wheels go. He's going to be the one yelling you about all those things. The squeaky wheel makes the most grease or sorry, uh, 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 totally backwards. Let's, let's squeaky butcher wheel. all of them today. <laughs> <laughs> squeaky mouse. Cutting needs something. Hairs. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the squeaky wheel is the one that usually needs the most grease. Right. And in this case, if a person's making a ton of noise and being angry and being mean, especially about letting things open up then that's because they're worried they're going to get dropped so it, it, remember that in the breakaway yeah it's you have to know is that person doing this strategically or are they going to die because in a yeah. breakaway it's good and, and when it's on the back and if they're going to die you yelling at them will not fix anything right <laughs> like you can't just be like oh try harder and they're going to be like oh you're right i could have stayed this whole time <laughs> but pete like for you how often do you open up gaps going into corners on purpose uh, every every single corner every single corner, every right? single corner of every single race unless Why unless something bad is happening like unless i'm in trouble and i'm on i'm out of i'm not in control of the situation anymore which does happen but if i can choose because i feel more confident in my ability to extract slightly more speed out of every corner um which 
the gap actually gives me the freedom to do. I can't extract more speed if I'm following the same line as everybody else and following the same speed as everybody else. But if I can give up, <clears throat> even if it's like 18 inches, um, 18 inches is enough to get you, I'm making up numbers, but half a mile an hour or something. And that half a mile an hour for me is probably 50 watts less out of the next corner, um, which changes the, that makes me finish races. Um, I, I'm not that... I'm good at the on off stuff. And so more micro rests I can cram into a race, the better I'm going to be. Um, and a lot of that is actually waiting to pedal later into the corner. So I'll start coasting five seconds to go into the corner. And then you actually take one or two pedal strokes to get your, traje your trajectory right and your speed up so that you run into the back of them. And hopefully you're actually gaining on them as they're coming out of the corner. So while they're doing the bigger effort, you're still you're like slingshotting shake and bake style around, uh, around them and coming back in and slotting back in. And so if everything works perfectly, you pedaled one, you pedaled probably five pedal strokes less. You pedaled one pedal stroke while they weren't pedaling. You maximized your 18 inches of gap and probably took the corner slightly wider and, uh, maybe slightly tighter. So you, you straightened out the corner more. And then as they're accelerating, you're probably going to come around them just slightly. And as they get back up to speed, you slot back in while you're actually slowing down while their acceleration is happening. So that's a perfect scenario where you just saved, I don't know, it's a very small amount, but if you do that hundreds of times over the course of the race, that's, it's huge. Uh, it's mm -hmm. huge. It changes. That's the only way I can finish races. Honestly, if I, if, the, if I'm oh, go ahead, no, you go, uh, <laughs> I was going to say when it, when a race is totally strung out single file and I don't have choices to make like that. Um, that's when I get into trouble. If the race is strung out single file and it's wheel after wheel after wheel, and even, even with my six inches or 12, 18 inches to play with, it's not enough to like, keep me in the group. I always need it to slow down. It, hopefully it slows down eventually, but some races never do. And then you're just, you get 75th or something and you tried as hard as you could for the whole race and it doesn't matter. Um, mm -hmm. so it only works if there's variance in the field and in the pace, but every time there's more variance, there's more opportunity to do this. Uh, better and move up correctly and pass, you know, get, get back into the right position to do it over again. So yeah. The, the worst is, is if Pete was right on that wheel or with like six inches, took it faster and then had to break right before everyone accelerates. Like, has anyone ever done that before? Oh yeah. And then you're like yeah. actually <laughs> slower and you're like, oh, now the momentum and Pete not heavy. And like, well, then you have to really accelerate. Um, so that's an example. If someone's like, don't open gaps in the corner. So like, they might not understand unless if you have Pete in front of you or John, <laughs> Ivy, I've never ridden with you. I'm assuming you're a good corner too, with all your cross skills and stuff. Amber, get right on that wheel. Uh, mm -hmm. with, you, with other people though, you have a gap and Pete, you probably, uh, I'll ask both you, Pete and Ivy. Based on the rider in front of you, like if it's one of the cliff people, Pete, you're probably right on their wheel versus yeah. like a, a person that you know on another team. Do you guys have different gaps first on based on who and who it is in front of you? For sure. Oh, if you look at Ivy's face, Ivy, you say. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, for sure. <laughs> and I wonder like if how, how much of what Jay is describing and worried about is caused by that misconception that you need to be like on the wheel. Like mm -hmm. you need to be like on it in the corner. Like how much of that is like creating that like anxious, like reactive, like grab, break, accelerate, like catastrophe type stuff that mm -hmm. he's worried about that he might feel that first race back, you know, um, by, ha by being so close and like, you know, not, we're assuming that everyone around you is like rusty too. And everyone else is going to like grab break when they shouldn't and like make weird movements when they shouldn't and like take weird lines. And so, yeah, how much of that would be resolved by just like giving a little room. Um, but yeah, there are definitely people that like, you know, and can ride, ride super close to in a corner and man, is it a uh, chef's kiss. I love it. Just, uh... <laughs> and the opposite is there's, there's people that you're around and there should be alarm bells going off, like big old red, like get away from here. This is the worst place to be. And like, I'll give up 10 or 15 wheels to get as far away from them as I possibly can. And because it's yeah. never, it's, it's like they're. Uh, their wave is the opposite of yours and you're like breaking into their acceleration and it's just this tug of war that that blows you up so get away from people that aren't agreeing with it the way you're racing
along those lines, this is a great opportunity for all of us to make cycling better <clears throat> is instead of yelling at that person where they're throwing the alarm bells that we shouldn't be by them, just, just don't ride behind them or ride around them. Like don't, don't yell at somebody in the middle of a race. If, if you know, Doesn't cause happen. that's really common. Like you see that. And like Nate said, it's not going to change anything in the moment. Everyone's like in this crazy fight or flight like state. And they're like, literally fighting for their lives, at least in terms of the mindset in the moment, right? You're perceiving all this danger. You're on the limit doing all of that. So yelling at somebody is, is not productive <laughs> at land park. So we record our stuff with GoPros and going into, I was a P one, two, and I think John and Pete were, uh, next to each other back in the field. I was the first one into the little tricky chicane corner and they go, on the recording, you can hear they're like, oh no, Nate's in front. Uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> have you not let you know that I uh, I put like a 15 foot gap on the field yeah. when I went through that little corner. And then in San Rafael, the same thing, uh, that would happen. My corner is better, but I bring this up because in the, I have a reputation as a like bad back handle just because of the stuff I say on this podcast. In the back, the best, someone will yell at me, oh, you're dropping wheels, blah, blah, blah. And I let that space open. But then I let them fill it in. They yeah. get behind me thinking that I'm going to like not be able to, you know, do something or I just keep going back and they're so frustrated or frantic that they get ahead of me and they yes. pull me up. And that is a great strategy. <laughs> if you're race with me, just stop listening for a second. That's a great strategy to like uh, <laughs> skip ahead. You don't want to hear this part um, to, to save energy the whole time uh, to, to have that happen. And if you can let other people fill the gaps for you, it's like this uh, mutual assured destruction I've talked about before. Um, you just keep kind of backing off and I'm, I'm good at the hard 30 second efforts. Um, hopefully too, where they don't, uh, they can't even get on my wheel, right. An acceleration. I can do a few of those in a race. Um, just make them fill those gaps. Another one, um, I want everyone's opinion on this. Cause I don't know if I did the, the wrong thing here. I was in a master's race. I was in second wheel going into a corner and the first, the first guy took this really weird line into the corner and I took a better line. And I actually ended up ahead of him, but someone behind me goes, you can't do that. Blah, blah, blah. You got to follow the wheel in front. You got to follow the line. But I thought it was a bad line. So, but I, and I wasn't, there wasn't people next to me on the side. So that like, I deviated the whole, um, Peloton, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? It was, it was strung out. And, um, he talked to, he yelled at me in the middle of the race and he was, it was like the third lap, but he was much older, which that happens sometimes. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. He was a sage person in the Peloton who was trying to help. What do you, th what do you think everyone? I think uh, if you deviate you and it's a, yeah. <laughs> I think if you deviate and it's a bad line, like, like you truly took a bad line that endangered people. Yes. But otherwise there's absolutely nothing saying that you, that you have to follow the line that anybody else is taking. As long as it's safe, everything is fair game in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one, one more thing is if, if you are on the front and you don't want to be on the front, you can purposely take a bad line to get out of the trajectory and slow yourself down. Um, so I'm not saying that's what the guy in first wheel was doing, but it is something else to think about. If you find yourself too far up and you don't want to be as far up as you are, you can take a worse line and slow yourself down without, um, doing any work to slow yourself down, like break every time you break, you're just wasting Watts. So if you can coast through a corner, go super wide or go really wide into a corner and then kind of come back in and let the Peloton fill in in front of you. Um, but it's your, it's your race. You can take whatever line you want and however you get there, as long as it's not dangerous for anybody else, you can do anything you want. It's like the race is there. There's Preach. curbs on the side, right? <laughs> Ivy, what but, do you think? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, oh yeah. I would just say, I would say exactly that. Like, there are no rules, man. Like, um, <laughs> I hate the like, hold your line thing. Like, what does that mean? Do we never move in a bike race? Like, do we all just like stay? Do we die here? Like, yeah. um, <laughs> like, um, I, I can see how like changing a line in a corner can be dangerous specifically, like when someone like comes straight into the apex, like, um, but like, I know that you didn't do that, especially if you like came out of the corner faster than the person in the first wheel, like there's no chance that that happened. So like, therefore, like, how could this have been dangerous, especially if mm. like the rest of the Peloton is still behind you, like kind of speaks to homeboy was just mad. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think what, I think what happened is he was expecting to follow the first person's wheel and then he did not follow mine and he, he got kind of like. I, I think the per first person took two, two, um, 
too tight. I went a little bit wider, but he was on the outside of my wheel and he was expecting to cross into me and he got, mm -hmm. he messed himself up. You know what I mean? He was gonna, he was almost turning into my wheel as it happened. And then he yelled at me for doing that, but it wasn't a tight, it was like a wide, a very, it wasn't even a 90 degree turn. It was kind of a wide turn. You know how into an um, parking lot or you on the little streets and a 90 degree turn does not have to be a 90 degree turn. The road yeah. is so big and you have the whole thing. It's, it's almost like a straight line. It's a very gradual glide. But if you're following mm -hmm. like the yellow line in the middle, you're like, oh, I got to take an absolute 90 degree turn right here when you can really just use more of the road and um, make mm -hmm. it a lot straighter and keep your speed up. You can we, pedal on, too. Yeah, for sure. Uh, on an upcoming episode that I've recorded, which uh, y'all get to hear likely at the end of this month with uh, 2017 pro crit, tramp, er, crit champ Erica Carney, uh, she's awesome. Uh, Erica Alar, uh, other name uh, that you may know her by her maiden name. Uh, but I recorded an episode with her and actually, and I'm just, I'm going to tease this question more than anything, because Nate, I think this is the other reason that happens. Um, there was somebody that wrote in that asked basically like, Hey, like trainer roads made me fast. So suddenly I'm at the front of group rides. And I found out that I can't ride when I'm at the front of a group. Like, I don't know how to like pick a turn or pick a line through a turn because instead of following people, I'm the one deciding the line. And I think that a lot of people, have difficulty understanding what the right line is. And I'm not saying that they, they might even not consciously recognize this. So then when somebody takes a different line, it's like, you're breaking from the obvious choice here, the obvious decision. This is the norm. This is what's safe. That's what they're classifying in their mind because they may not be able to see it differently. Uh, so a lot of it is just like the psychology of the, the space that that person's head is in at that moment. And a lot of the times, since that's a deviation from the norm, it will upset them because it introduces choice and confusion instead of just simple, this is where you go on the course. So uh, by the way, Erica does a fantastic job of answering that question and plenty of other ones. It's going to be a great episode. Uh, look forward for that one. Um, uh, getting back to the core of Jay's question here about getting better at this. So really it, it, it pete you mentioned something that's really important and we all know this it's really hard to learn skills like imagine if you were trying to learn to play the piano and you had a person like first of all you had to learn to play it in a public space like in a mall where people are like walking by and, or you had like instructors yelling at you every time you made a mistake or like really harsh consequences like that would be a bad learning environment mm -hmm. and that's what we kind of do that's what pete did this weekend of getting back used to it like his skill didn't go away, but his familiarity did. And he's like, Hey, familiarity come back in the most high pressure situation possible, please. Like with, and yeah, with GoPros on so everybody <laughs> can see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Even more. Right. So if you have the luxury of being able to just ride with somebody first, like ride with friends, uh, one or two people, a little more kind of work your way into that. And at first just start out riding within what you feel comfortable uh, you know, where your comfort zone is. And then that comfort zone will, will expand over time or, or shrink, I guess, in this case, and you'll get closer to the person and you'll be able to ride more comfortably. So if you can do that, that's great because there's another aspect to this, that even though you may know what to do and have a track record of doing the right thing, once you go cross-eyed, because the efforts are so hard, we don't we don't perform as well. It's a lot tougher. It's actually one of the reasons uh, tomorrow Pete's going to go on the e-bike on the mountain bike, and we're going to ride an XCO course here in Reno. And Pete's going to hammer me basically. And I have to try to not drop Pete's wheel is the goal. So, which we're going to put GoPros on by the way. So this will be some good <laughs> right. race analysis stuff. Um, <laughs> cool. but the reason that I want to do that is because I know that I'm, I'm fine making choices on which line to take and how to ride when I'm in a normal, clear headed state, but when I'm completely exhausted and I'm, I'm boxed and I'm not thinking straight, that's when I make bad decisions. And I don't want to just show up at races and basically say, okay, body, get re body and mind, get reconditioned to this environment right now. I'd rather get used to it beforehand. So you can get creative with it. Uh, if it's just one person, or if it's not one person, then, um, you know, you can jump into group rides, but definitely just try to ride where you're comfortable. I think all of us are probably going to have to go through a reconditioning phase right now. I heard that at that race that you were at Pete, which is the first one in NorCal, uh, for a long time for over a year, I heard that one had uh, quite a lot of crashes compared to normal and that makes sense. So yeah. it's, uh, we have to be as safe as possible with these ones for sure. Uh, should we move on to Peter's question? 
Let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah. Okay. He says, I have a dilemma and I'm not sure which is the best strategy because of my work and family commitments. I have to sometimes do my workouts just before bedtime. You talked a lot about recovery, nutrition, and its importance, but I've also read that eating just before bedtime is not the most healthy time to eat. These are in his mind, mutually exclusive things to eat or not to eat. That is the question. How would you choose? So, uh, this is, man, there are a lot of things that we may sound like a broken record on a number of different things that we'll say here, but so this is like this, we kind of like force paradoxes upon ourselves or paradoxes, whatever it may be, uh, speak is hard today, but we force these upon ourselves <laughs> and we basically say like, okay, so I have to do this or I have to do this. And there's no other question. Like a great example of this is like, I have to eat before my workout or I have to not eat before my workout. And that's it. But then when we tell people, no, like you can eat during your workout and that can help, or you can add in plenty of other things around that. So this is an example, Peter, if I think that you don't have to face such dire polarized black or white circumstances that you're saying if to eat or not to eat, what do I do? But answering this question hopefully can be informative for people. Um, Pete, we talked about context for this because Pete mm -hmm. being a person who trains and that sort of stuff, we have to separate that from the typical like, uh, advice on, on eating late at night. Right. Yeah. And it, nutrition advice is, is a crazy thing because every it's, it's applicable to everybody. Um, so when they're writing articles or creating something that grabs your attention, um, they want you to think about this thing that is, and it affects everybody. So if you tell, if you just have a headline that says, do not eat late at night, period. And there are health benefits to not eating late at night, but it's a standalone, um, <clears throat> like common, uh, practice that would benefit a majority of people. But I think one of the things is Peter probably isn't the majority of people. If you're a training athlete, if you're, um, worried, if you're thinking actively about your fueling strategy for your workouts during the day, <laughs> I would say you're a different type of athlete. Um, <laughs> yeah, just you're not no a normal person, right? Yes. So yeah. it's, it's, uh, it's really hard to take face value for nutrition tips for everybody and make them directly applicable to you. Um, but what you can do is you can kind of frame yourself as what is the most important thing for you and then decide how the, the tips that you're reading, um, kind of bounce off of that or stick to that. Um, and so I think this was one where, uh, John, I think you said it really well, like, uh, fueling isn't based around three square meals a day. Um, which is makes a lot of sense if you kind of use your train if your training is your most important thing that day use that as the anchor point for your fueling strategy throughout the day then it's not it's not whether it's 8 a.m or midnight it's i have a workout that i want to be successful at and i'm going to eat accordingly with the meals before that and fuel properly during it and recover after it based on the workout which is the most important thing of my day and it doesn't matter what time the clock says it matters that i felt good I, re I recovered well after the workout and I went to sleep, right? Like those are the, those are the things that matter the most. It doesn't matter what, if it's eight 15, when you eat breakfast, much less so mm -hmm. than, uh, yeah. just nailing your workout. So I think that's the, the crux of this is make sure that what you're reading is applicable to you and make sure that the thing that you're, um, like focusing on is actually valuable and will make in turn be productive to whatever you're trying to accomplish. So what that looks like from a practical manner is you don't have to eat breakfast at 8 a.m., lunch at noon, dinner at 6 p.m., and then you have to fit in everything else around that. Instead, you look at your nutrition as it builds toward that workout, and then around that workout, throughout that workout, and after that workout, you have a nutrition plan to be able to fuel that workout. So it, instead of looking at his three square meals, now I've got to train and somehow I've got to figure out all of this stuff. Ivy, um, maybe we can talk a bit about like the PM, you know, evening time, not being the, the best time to eat. Yeah. So I think that the context of that kind of broad nutritional advice is important to consider for athletes. Um, like why is Peter worried about this? Like worried about, um, if you eat too much, not being able to like get restful sleep or is it like a worried about gaining weight thing? Like, you know, there are a lot of, I, I don't know what exactly they're considering, but like, if you just did a really hard workout later, later at night, like you're not going to go right to sleep anyways. Like if you're worried about like a big heavy meal, like sitting near your gut and keeping you from falling asleep, like 
if you just did a hard workout, like you're not going to go to sleep like right away anyways. Um, uh, yeah. And I mean, on the, on the other side of it, I feel like a common question we get a lot is about like, I have a really early workout. Like how do I eat a big meal in the morning? Like, um, all of these broad new, yeah, Pete nailed it. The, the broad nutritional advice, like has to be placed within context of like you as an athlete and like really specific to cycling. So much of this can be solved by fueling your workouts during, and then like a recovery drink thereafter. And you can just solve so much from it, but uh, we need to make like a very clear distinction. Like you are not the person that's getting up at midnight and then going down to the fridge and making just like a really huge, like unhealthy, like, you know, destroying a whole bag of potato chips, right? Like midnight snackers that that's different than you just doing your workout and then having to refuel yourself. That's, that's profoundly different in this case. So separate, separate your case from, from that. And then once again, take the perspective of just fueling your work, not trying to fit something in and, and figure out the logistics of three square meals and how those fit. Nate, what say you? Uh, yeah. So the I do have science back this up. Uh, <laughs> the, okay. So the, the, let's just, the whole, th- let's question the premise of eating late at night of it being unhealthy. There is, um, it's, it's changed throughout the years of what people think. I think right now you probably hear it mostly from like the intermittent fasting crowd. And that is talking about mechanisms, but when they look at outcomes, you're fine eating late at night. There's also research saying that if you eat a, this is different than what we used to think. And I think we've even said this in the podcast, but if you eat a high glycemic meal right before bed, you actually sleep better, which is also crazy too. And you know, it's really good after training, a high glycemic meal right? Uh, during that period for like recovery. Uh, this is, you're going to be fine, Peter, you can eat late at night and, uh, you're, you're going to be good. If you, I would just say individual, if you individually, if you find that if I eat this, it's harder to go to sleep or something like that. But I honestly, I have no problems with this stuff, but I know some people do then don't eat that. Try something else, but I wouldn't have the stress around it and you're going to be great. And you're not going to just wake up with um, all this fat on your body. I think that's the, that's the worry mm-hmm. of people think like, if I, if I eat at night, I'm going to wake up with, uh, all this fat on my body, but it's not true. Um, a bunch of pro, this is anecdotal now, but lots of pro athletes who are extremely thin, they, they eat a huge carbohydrate meal, carbohydrate meal, right before they go to bed. Keegan being one of them, he did cereal mm-hmm. every night, um, to refuel. Right. And they, they want to get glycogen back in and they have early morning workouts. As Ivy said, it is, you can have a very, very lean, uh, lean body. And if you look, look at like actual outcome research, there's no different. It's really interesting too, is they took, um, there used to be in weight training about protein timing, right? And they used to be like, you need to have six meals a day, protein every time space this stuff out. And what they did then is, um, there's also now intermediate fasting group who says that, mm-hmm you know, it's better to do it this way. And what they've done research on is to see what, what if you have all your protein during this like feeding window, like four to six hours, or if you spread it out over the day. And what they found is there was no difference. It was the same either way. Intermittent fasting, intermittent fasting can be a great way to lose weight for those who struggle with portion control in eating in a caloric deficit, because you can only eat so much at a certain time. But apparently now based on the outcome research that we know there's nothing magical about having that fast other than you're not eating. Um, and I know people will argue that and Ivy can answer all those questions on the forum for us. But um, like they think it's they're, they're not saying that there couldn't be something right. We're just not, as far as I'm aware of the research, there's mechanisms that they think happen. But if you look at outcomes like that, where they take two groups and they control it really well, there's not a significant difference between those two things. And I just want to make sure I say this very clearly because people will message me on Instagram too. I understand that the mechanisms, like people say, oh, if you do this, you're burning fat all day and therefore your body comp's going to be better. Um, you got to just prove it with like an actual study, right? Of saying one group's eating this way, other group's eating this way. And then there, we get a more likely than chance and it's statistically different outcome for the group that was intermittent fasting. Cause that's what I think this Peter's kind of getting that into his, his head. Um, so yeah. it just, it's cool, Peter, just eat. 
yeah, defining mechanics of, uh, you know, mechanistic differences about how the body performs in one way or another, that part's more or less, I, I say easy, but that's more common. The actually getting to the outcome side of things from that mechanism is really hard. And there are a lot of companies that build products around mechanisms, but then they can't ever prove the outcome, right? So the mechanism makes sense, but it's really hard. Every fad diet over the last 30 years has always been about mechanism. And yeah. they always have some kind of, cause that's how they sell it. There's a proof mm -hmm. of a little mechanism, a mechanism inside of it. And then everyone thinks it's that thing. And then there's a new one and there's a new mechanism. And yeah. you know what? There's a couple diets that's, that stay lots of vegetables, um, <laughs> whole grains, lean proteins, healthy fats. That's like not the one much. that stays and not too much. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> and it's hard to, if you eat those things, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, um, lean protein and healthy fats. Uh, it's really hard to eat too much. I mean, not really hard, but it's harder than if you're eating Popeye's or, um, some mm -hmm. other kind of meal. Anyways, oh, off my soapbox. <laughs> this is, this is yeah, that one. triggered you. Whoa. You okay? <laughs> I triggered, I triggered some people. Yeah. You just triggered some... a lot of people. <laughs> Please. Where should they put it? Put it on your favorite nutrition forum. <laughs> no, yeah. we can do it in our report. That's good. <laughs> For Easy. sure. So this, uh, once and Peter, something else that I've noticed, a lot of athletes will mistake in, in it, like, uh, an interrupted nights of sleep or just a hard time falling asleep with the effort that you did. So like post crit our weekly, like summertime crit series, it's the, worst. the a group finishes That's around it. like seven, like eight o'clock no, basically like is when we finish. Right. Yeah. yeah. And then I have to, and then I go home and I try to sleep after just completely destroying myself. My legs feel like individual campfires, just bonfires. Like I can't go to sleep, <laughs> hot legs. I'm uncomfortable. My mind is totally revved up from the race. And sometimes you can have a really hard workout that also kind of puts you in a similar headspace, and it's hard to wind down from that. So there's a, a lot of the time we'll hear that. And then we'll just associate it with the common advice of, well, it's hard to sleep on a full stomach or after eating. And that's why you shouldn't eat before bed. And that's like a common, uh, I, I should say misattribution that you could make with that. So make sure that you're understanding all the different variables that could be contributing to that. If you are indeed getting to the point where you have trouble sleeping, but I usually train in the evenings now, but not perhaps uh, when you're doing it in this case, Peter, but I usually train sometime around five to 7 PM and are four to 6 PM, somewhere around there. And when I do that, I have to afterward eat quite a lot still, because the, if I eat all the way through the day and I'm eating whole grains, vegetables, all that stuff, it's tough to be able to eat enough to be able to just offset the caloric deficit beforehand. So, but I do that. I eat through my workout. And then thereafter, I don't have to eat this gigantic meal because I've been building throughout the day toward this workout. And then I fuel during the workout and I had a recovery drink. So then it's just a reasonable thing that I have thereafter. So if, if people fueled their workouts during, or well, I should say before with good nutrition during and after it's suddenly such like, it just removes so many problems with timing, yeah. with, with, uh, mm -hmm. caloric balances, which we're going to get into more later, but it just makes a huge difference when you really try to fuel adequately during and after in particular. So, uh, rapid fire questions, which by the way, we need more rapid fire questions. We didn't get a lot this week. Uh, and as a result, we're all missing out on questions that should be answered quickly that never are. So, uh, Nick's sec next question. He says, Vittoria run flat inserts for road tires go. So I assume you want our opinions on them. Awesome. Uh, yes. Yeah. It, we, we said this was coming for, I mean, but it was clear. It's not like we were some, this wasn't prophetic, like, but this is something that had to come to the road for sure. It's just roads always really slow to adopt, uh, things that come from the off-road side of things usually. But the, what's man, the purpose? Yeah. So they're tire inserts. They go inside your tire and here's where the purpose is being really misunderstood. And I think it's a branding problem because they're calling them run flats. So we should talk about run flats on a car, right? That's a very different thing. So a run flat tire on a car that's has really stiff sidewalls. They're substantial enough so that they can support the weight of the car at a certain speed to like limp into a service station, so to speak. So that way you don't have to drive on your rim, but you can drive on that. So the big complaint with running those tires on cars is the fact that you lose a lot of handling. And the reason for that is because the sidewalls are so stiff that your tire doesn't, it's not compliant anymore. doesn't hold traction, rides really rough and uncomfortable. 
And as a result, your car just doesn't perform as well on a road bike. If we actually had true run flats, oh my goodness, they would be terrible. And it would probably be the scariest experience ever trying to the corner on them. So I'm trying to put them on the rim. Trying to get oh my gosh. <laughs> yes. That would be terrible. Throw, throw it away. Get a new wheel. Yeah, yeah seriously. <laughs> so these are not run flats and that's something that really needs to get communicated. Now, what they're talking about is the benefit that yes, it's better than having nothing inside your tire or a tube inside your tire because this foam insert, basically it's a pool noodle. It's just uh, a little bit tighter weave. There's less, you know, gaping holes. It's a pool noodle that's cut to a specific size that fits inside your tire. Now, the benefit of that in the roadside, yes, if you get a flat, you can roll on it and it won't be as catastrophic. However, this is absolutely not something where it's like, I got run flats. I can go into this turn at full speed. I'm totally okay. You cannot. Uh, so they're not run flats. All they are is the same inserts that you see on the mountain bike side of things. It's the, it's an insert that goes in there that allows a couple benefits. You can run low pressures and not have to worry about breaking your rims or pinching or anything like that. When you hit your tire against your rim because of a strong impact, because you have foam in between your tire and the rim. So that really helps. The other thing is that you get, uh, yes, some sort of benefit instead of just running on a flat tire, but for road, that's kind of it. Like the lower pressures could give you some better traction as well. And if you're having to run really high pressure, since you dropped the volume like that, and you have that foam in there that actually acts as a different kind of like, a, it's not just air since you have foam that behaves differently when it compacts as a result, you can run lower pressure, but they're not run flats. And it's worrisome to see that because I could totally see somebody just blowing into a turn with a flat tire and thinking they're okay. My, my understanding is they're not for a lower pressure. Nate, I think you're for... muted. I'm not muted. Am I muted? Or maybe it's me. Oh, yeah, Nate's everyone good. else can hear me. Yeah. Um, my impression is that the only, the only, they're not for running lower pressure. It's just for safety. And this is if you slice a tire or you get a big flat and you're in a corner, it'll be very, it'll be much less unlikely that your um, tire will roll off your rim and you'll have a really bad day. So you're going to have a bad day still and you're going to flatten, you're going to have to stop. But the catastrophic, which always like, that's in my mind when I'm descending, that you get a flat and it gives you a little bit extra time maybe to slow down and stop with more control versus uh, just like it, it, especially with the Victoria course of speed where like paper thin, you slice those things and they go from instant pop to nothing. And that's yeah. it. John, can you hear us? No, John <laughs> can't right. hear us. He just uh, said, no. I was, I was going to say that uh, it's, it's everybody who's ridden where you, where you've only pumped your tire up to 30 PSI or 40 PSI, there's air in the tire and it's low, but you can feel something. I'm imagining this is what that feels like. So it's not, you're not going to continue racing on it. Just like John said, but exactly like Nate said, it makes us, it adds this barrier of safety to everything you do. And the way, the one thing I was thinking about that would be so nice is I flatted two miles away from home so many times where I just want to ride home. I don't want to, I don't want to change it. Like, <laughs> you know, 18 blocks away from home. I just want to ride at 10 miles an hour home and then deal with it when I get there. And so this would actually do that. And so I was like, man, I could put that in my training wheels and then I would never worry about flat tires again. But and they're so light in this case, I can hear you all again. Thank goodness. Um, <laughs> uh, sorry, Maxine, because it's probably going to mess up the recordings and stuff. Uh, Maxine's our awesome editor for this, but, uh, the, the nice part is they don't weigh hardly anything. I'm not sure what the exact weight is on these 20, ones, but 22 grams. Yeah. That's so light, right? Like I, I challenge anybody to say 44 grams. I notice it, especially when you're talking about like rotating mass, since it's always in motion, right? Like you're not going to notice that. Um, so this is something that on the mountain bike side of things, like Kush core is a brand that a lot of people use. And those are heavy and this is like totally different. Um, so I think they're awesome. I, 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 and I plan to run them for sure. Uh, you know, but it's definitely not a run flat. So, uh, Ty's question. He says, what is the best phone case for mountain biking? And I assume he's talking about like a phone case that goes on your bars. Um, in which case I've seen quad lock seems like the one I've seen most often. Pete, you mentioned you saw a guy do a backflip on Instagram with it. So it's gotta be good. It's gotta be good. And yeah. I, my phone case is a fanny pack on mountain bike. Uh, yeah. Your, then, your hip, hip pack is the best. Phone yeah. Case. Hands, hands-free belt satchel. <laughs> just anything to <laughs> wow that was a lot of mental gymnastics to not call that a fanny pack um yeah so I, I can we talk about putting phones on bars really quick i know this is rapid fire but like cyclists don't do that no, it's not 
<laughs> cyclists, cyclists don't do that. And new cyclists say, why the heck don't you do that? Like, why do you buy a separate inferior computer to go on your bars? And like my answer to that is I don't want to damage my phone. Well, quad lock, I think they make like a really protective case. That's probably that one's solved. I think the other one is I don't want my phone to run out of battery because it's like my lifeline. And if I'm, you know, using that and tracking with that, then it could run out of battery. I guess the other one too, if you really want to get fussy is like one is a better quality GPS than another, perhaps. I don't know, but I, I, the answers are kind of not really strong for why Sweat. you wouldn't put your farm on there. Hard to touch. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. I definitely don't. I, I, I think that it's like a, a lot of people see it as like a sign of a noob when they see like the phone on the bars, but it probably doesn't need to be that way. I guess is a point that I'm trying to get at. So, so run, run a quad lock tie, uh, Nils during a corner and race. Do you a grab the front brake, B grab the rear brake or C grab both brakes. And I think that this is a trick question, maybe Nils, uh, because you probably shouldn't just grab your brakes in the middle of a corner <laughs> so and say, get your braking done beforehand. Uh, yeah, and brakes only slow you down. That's so <laughs> if you don't and need no to brakes. slow down for the corner, no brakes. Answer D, none. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> this is a good question though, because I, it does vary for me. If I'm riding mountain bikes, I actually will grab one or the other or both depending on different scenarios. But I thought about this on the road. I think I always grab the same. I think I, I are, are you guys the same? Is everybody the same here? Like just, I grab both at the same time. I'm a trail think... breaker on the road oh. bike just Meaning. because meaning I only grab the rear brake a little bit and I don't do a brake. I do a little like a uh, modulation because I need every watt that I can get. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't want to break too much. Uh, and <clears throat> slowing down a little bit and maybe need a little bit more is okay with me. And, uh, so I, I almost never touch my front brake on the road bike. If I'm touching my front brake, I'm probably already crashing. Uh, so mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I, I, in turns where it's been slippery, like it's raining. And if there's like a panic moment where like, I have to deviate, I don't jam on the front brake really hard in those situations, but I also don't necessarily jam on the rear brake because as soon as you lose traction with the rear, they're, they're tied together still. And if you lose traction with the rear, it makes it a lot easier to lose traction with the front. Uh, so if that rear tire slips and the front end easily comes out as well. So but on, on mountain bikes coming into turns, there are tons of times where I'm, I will be more rear or more front. Like if you have ruts and you're riding in at like, if it's Southern California or California in general, this is really common. The trails are all kind of like a trench and you're kind of riding the bottom of the trench. And if you hit your front brake, a lot of the time what it happens is it wants to pull up the sides of that trench when you're in those scenarios. Pete and I saw that at uh, EWS North Star. You can check out the YouTube playlist to see my first person footage of that, of going through these trenches. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. With dust in the bottom. So yeah, you can't flashbacks. see anything. Like, like yeah. eight inches of dust that conceal where your tire is. So you have no clue. And you're just like pin, like a pinball down this chute. But in those situations, you can't yeah. use your front brake. Cause if you do, it makes you crash. So you are just on your back brake and that's hard because it can't slow you down. So there's plenty of reasons why you might vary it in off-road circumstances, even cyclocross I could see. Uh, but I think I'm almost always just both on the road, I think. So, uh, okay. This is the last rapid fire one, uh, from Sam. What is your opinion on why Matthew Vanderpool sat up during the Ronde van Vlaanderen sprint or tour Flanders sprint? Was it physical or mental fatigue? And then the question is, is he overtrained? I think it'd be presumptuous for all of us to <clears throat> start talking about the training status and fatigue status of Matthew Vanderpool, <clears throat> because he's seems like just absolutely uh he's he's incredible he's like a machine for how much racing he can do year round um so we probably won't talk about that but uh, what are your thoughts on this for everybody that saw this he was but there was just two riders coming down to it him and casper askren they sprinted and he sat up early and just kind of coasted in shaking his head uh it wasn't because like anybody took his line or anything like that it wasn't anything like that he he's just stopped beat. yeah <clears throat> beat. i think that's the, I don't know how many heads up sprints you've ever done where you knew you weren't winning. Uh, most of the time I set up too. Uh, 
if mm -hmm. if someone passes if you're sprinting as hard as you can and someone crawls past you and you don't you double down and you're not gaining anything you're not going to magically win in the last 50 meters no matter how much you hope or wish and so you just sit up uh it's hard to keep pedaling as hard as you can when you're losing especially if there's no peloton there's no one else behind them it was just them mm -hmm. so you mm -hmm. you do that i mean how many do you ever race with your friends and they sprint ahead and you're just like yeah i'm gonna sit up <laughs> yeah it hurts so reason... much right to like why would you keep making yourself hurt like to yeah, yeah. especially when you have more races coming up like yeah. too you know what i mean he's, i'm sure he's plenty fatigued that day he doesn't need to do anything more also it's like you say hey well why why didn't he win the sprint it's so in the racing like it could have been one match right if he would have not had one more effort he might have had an extra bike length you know in there and then that would have uh made uh the whole outcome different it's it's, mm -hmm. it's so i think say like mental or physical fatigue i mean obviously he was fatigued so yes probably he lost the sprint because he was physically fatigued um but i don't even know if he was fresh if he if they were both fresh who would win one and who knows ivy, ivy. did you see this what do you think uh, yeah. I mean, like speaking to, was it physical or mental, mental fatigue or overtrained, like the number of reasons that you can mess up a sprint are like astronomical, like who knows? And to like, try to dissect it and be like, like, look at his timing and like, is it like, who, who knows like why he didn't win, but ultimately yes. When you like know that it's over and know that you've lost, like, yeah, you sit up, like it's over. Um, but I guess like to try to figure out why that happened, like, who knows, we could talk about that for like several hours, <laughs> like, the number of ways in which you can mess up your timing and for it to go wrong. Who knows? I have been in this situation where like, I, so maybe Sam, what you're asking is like, did he mentally drop out before he physically dropped out? Cause I have had in sprints where I've just like, or in any effort where I've just like, I turn off. <clears throat> And it kind of doesn't matter which goes first necessarily. It's just simply, I reached a breaking point and physical and mental fatigue probably accum or probably contributed to both of those things. But I, I, cause I saw some people were like, why did he sit up? Why didn't he sprint to the line? And it's like, goodness gracious. Can you imagine being in his position? Like, like doing all of that, what they did to become just the last two riders. And also the way that Vanderpool has to race, i I, I don't want to say that it's like unfair because it just is what it is, but he is so marked. He, he can't do anything without the entire field basing their strategy around him. Right. That's, that's the case. Like if you are listening to this and think you're a marked rider, imagine having the entire pro Peloton marking you. Like it's, it's gotta be really tiring. And maybe on the mental fatigue side, he's mentioned that he's, he's wants to focus on mountain biking after this because he wants to win the, uh, you know, mountain bike gold medal. Nobody, there aren't like seven teams trying to beat him there. Like he's probably really excited for mountain biking. Like it's when I watch these like spring classics, I feel kind of bad for him sometimes. I know that sounds silly, but it's just like, this has got to be not very fun for him to just be, you know, sitting and going through this and constantly not be able to do anything without an entire field reacting to him. So, uh, it'll be exciting. I just I think, Nino you know, probably just got to be really, oh yeah, please Nate, go ahead. No, no, no. It's always mental and physical fatigue. It's always a combo. Yeah. They're always together. Mm -hmm. Like there's never just one or the other. It's just presenting. It's like a shift mm -hmm. between the two. You always give up because it hurts yeah. too much. That's mental. You never give up. Well, that I know of that. Cause yep. you pass out. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Bigger problems. That's the case. <laughs> yeah. I, Nino shirter has got it. What what's gotta be going through his mind right now, knowing that Vanderpool has just been destroying all these road races entire, the entire Peloton he's been beating them. And now he's going to go race mountain biking. It's just, well, he yeah. hates COVID. Wish it was last year. <laughs> yeah, I know. Right. Every year is tougher for him since he's getting older too. And Vanderpool's at this point only getting better every year. Mm -hmm. So, oh yeah. Okay. Marcus's question, uh, five-star podcast. I've just finished listening to every episode in the space of three months. Holy cow. That's Marcus, that's podcast. impressive. <laughs> yeah. That's a lot of us too. Uh, I apologize. At the same time, I admire you. So it says, and have answered, you've answered countless questions. I didn't even know I had. So for that, I am thankful. However, after listening to every episode, I'm left with one question. It seems like Nate has tried every single supplement, natural food to improve performance. So what has Nate continued to consume and what has he dropped? Also, are there any new concoctions on Nate's radar? Fun question. This is tough because we talked about this and I, uh, 
my past self did all this research and I took, I take all this stuff that has barely any evidence, right? Like very small amount. And I, have an, I have this little like thing of like stuff. You look at my Instagram, I have them all up there. Um, and I still take them, but like, I can't explain to you without hours of hours and hours. And I didn't want to do hours and hours, but we have an article, don't we, John? Yes, we do. Yeah. Megan actually wrote an awesome article on this. It's called supplements for cyclists and triathletes. Do they make you faster? So kudos Megan on this. And this is, uh, so there are a lot of articles you could write on supplements. You could write about obscure supplements and be like, does it work? And at the end it'd be like, your mileage may vary. Megan did a great job of going through and basically outlining why you would want to take supplements, what would be the benefits of them, and then very basically which ones we do know actually have outcomes that improve or science that that says that there is something that is being improved there. So uh, you'll you'll be uh, disappointed if you're going there to try to find some sort of like niche, like a uh, side of like this thing that's just emerging or something else. Instead, you'll find reliable advice, which is exactly what you need. So check out that article and we'll link to that down below. Um, and then, awesome. yeah, check check out Nate's Instagram. He has all this stuff on there. Check out everybody on Instagram, by the way, if you're watching on YouTube, you can check us out, but Lee Jonathan underscore Ivy Audrain also forgotten for Pete and then tr.nate for Nate. The two that I can think of that I think I would recommend for everyone to be a fish oil supplement with lots of DHA and then uh, vitamin D3. Mm -hmm. And that those are the two that I think uh, would be beneficial for all cyclists. Yeah. That's good for general health too. Yeah. So just... yeah. Well, that's what, you know what? We can't be fast. If we don't have our health. Ain't that the truth? Yeah. Pete, do you have anything to add on this? I don't, I don't know if you want to jump in. Being <clears> no, the I, guy. I was going to say, Nate, Nate stole the words right out of my mouth. Uh, fish oil, I uh, really Omega, uh, an Omega supplement, uh, whatever, yeah, have to be fish, whatever, right. yeah, whatever you want and, uh, vitamin D and those two, uh, will increase your overall health, which is at the baseline, the most important thing. Awesome. Okay. Joe's question. It's about calorie balance for cyclists. So this is one I've seen a lot of people in live chat waiting for. So we're going to talk about it here now. So tune in. It says, Hey guys, great job on your product. It really has transformed my riding. I have a question related to energy balance whilst training. I've trained fairly consistently for the last year or so with trainer road and outdoors with a couple XC races thrown in on odd occasions. My training goals have been fairly obviously to or fairly obviously to have the maximum power that I can produce along with the minimum weight. You and everybody else listen to this, Joe. That's the that's the whole game, right? <laughs> so he says, until recently, I have seen consistent improvement in my FTP through training until I changed my diet. I've noticed that my FTP has dropped significantly over the last six to eight weeks from around 285 to 260 with a similar training load progressing through base and build phases. At the same time of this drop in FTP, I've been maintaining a caloric deficit of 500 calories a day <laughs> which has resulted in a loss in body weight of three kilograms, about 6.6 .6 pounds going from 78 kilograms to 75 kilograms. So that's 172 to 165 pounds on balance. This has actually resulted in a reduction in my power to weight ratio. This is like the outcome that happens so often, yeah. right? Can, I, can we just stop here for a second? Yeah. The, yeah. This is what we talk about. So you were actually too improving your FTP all the time. And now it's gone down and you're slower and the, if you have the same watt per kg, it's always better to be bigger, in my opinion, because mm -hmm. on the flats, it's so much better to do it. If you could be six watts per kilo at 200 pounds versus at 120 pounds, 200 pounds, six watt per kilo on anything flat, you're going to be a monster, right? Yes. But, uh, uh, but doing a six, seven, eight percent grade, you should be the same speed as that 120 person. Uh, this is, I mean, I hope everyone knows the answer to this question, li listening to this right here, but go ahead, John. Yeah. He says, this experience leads me to believe that I need to be as a minimum consuming the same calories as I am expending and more likely maintaining a slightly caloric excess to see the gains in performance that I am seeking. So is there any research out there that supports the level of caloric surplus required to see optimum performance gains? He also mentioned some details about himself that hopefully in listening to this, maybe you can draw some point of relativity or realize that you are not in this case, the same person as Joe. Joe says he's married 43 male one-year-old twins and a three-year-old. Woof. That's a lot of work right there. So then says busy job, body composition of about 13% body fat based on a withing scale riding for years, but only seriously training for a couple of years. So longtime subscriber to train road and mountain biker. So this is really common where we see people say, why is my power going down? And they actually kind of like what you said, Nate, it's never like when you're about why you would find a quitting point in a race, 
we always want to find the one reason that it, that that happened. However, almost always the reality is many things building in towards something, right? So when your power goes down, a lot of the time, it's funny because they'll say this plan sucks. Or like you can say my something else is really bad. You want to find this one thing that, that caused that. But in reality, what that is, is that's likely uh, many factors, but nutrition is a huge one and it gets ignored. And many times if it's not measured, it's really hard to reliably count upon it and how much it is contributing or not. So like a 500 calorie deficit, Ivy, you mentioned uh, that recently you found yourself in a spot kind of like subconsciously, you just slipped into a spot where you were maintaining a, a deficit unintentionally. Can you like, let us know like how much that was and then what effect that had for you? Yeah, I think, I think I've spoke to it a little bit on prior episodes, but, um, yeah, I, I didn't have like a, I don't know, something cognitively, I didn't get like signals that I was hungry and I was like operating at this enormous calorie deficit, like all the time, like, um, for years even. And, um, I was pretty underweight and like spontaneous crying and just like really not happy and not feeling good and not sleeping good. And, um, actually Pete helped me like find some baseline goals for carbohydrates and protein per day. And it took me so long to like force myself to eat more. It was really tricky. Like some people just like, don't, um, yeah, I don't know if, if, um, Joe is like miserable in his 500 calorie deficit, or if it's just like happening and feels fine to him. But like for, for a lot of people, like there's not a immediate, like they don't get that signal that you need to eat. And so that calorie deficit just kind of happens and your FTP just goes down and you don't really like realize it's happening. Um, mm. but, uh, sorry, what was your question? You just wanted me to speak to it. <laughs> yeah, I was starving yeah, and- myself. It was horrible. <laughs> Everything was bad. I don't know. <laughs> well, that's just the thing. A lot of people hear 500 calorie deficit and it's hard to know what that's like or what impact that would have. They're like, Oh, okay. That's just fine. That's like losing weight but that that's quite a lot. Like that's substantial. If you are an athlete that has a basal metabolic rate of somewhere between 1500 to 2000 calories, which probably covers a pretty decent portion of people here, 500 calories is a huge amount of that. That's a large portion that you're leaving out of your daily nutrition. That that has a profound effect to speak to like how that affects your performance. So I, I used to Strava a lot, like in like, 2012 to like 15 ish. Like I, I love to Strava. Like I, I wanted to get segments. Like I loved it. Mm-hmm. And it like wrecked my training most of the time <laughs> because I would like, I would like structure my training rider. Like I'm going to get that one today. And then that would be like my only effort because I wanted it to be like the best effort. Um, <laughs> but then I, I, so then changed my diet and like put on some weight, like honestly from pro road racing days, I'm 15 pounds heavier. And, and it's a lot of it is muscle mass. Most of it is muscle mass. And so I, um, I'm in an area that I used to get Strava segments in a lot. And I was like, oh, I should, this is interesting. Like I want to see like from this QOM that I got in like 2013, when I was emaciated and under a huge calorie deficit and had no idea, like, I want to do this climb again and like, see how I stack up. And I even did it after, um, after a set of uh, 30 thirties. So I was like pretty tired already or like had done a lot of work already. And I was like, ah, screw it. I'll just like see where I stack up. And I was within seconds of that Mm. QOM time that I got like six or seven years ago as 15 pounds heavier, having just done a pretty hard workout. And that really speaks to how, like, you know, I mean, there are exceptions with climbing of course, but, um, that yeah, really speaks to how, like, being as light as you can operating under a calorie deficit is not necessarily the best for your performance. Mm -hmm. And I feel like people are absolutely like fasted exercise. People are going to come for me in the comments, but like (laughs) that was just my experience. (laughs) Yeah. There's a lot of pressure for all of us. Like you said, Joe, in this case, like of having, we all want to be light and we all want to be powerful and we'll, we'll sound like a broken record for sure on this one, but it's not worth running yourself into the ground. Um, Nate, so I, and, and Pete, I don't know if, if you do this, but I measure my food only at times in the year, like strategically. And what I find a lot of the time is, uh, 
at first, when I first started measuring food, I realized, well, I'm eating a lot, right. And I'm eating too much, but now these days, a lot of the time I measure my food and I realize I'm not eating enough and I need to do a better job of fueling myself. It can go both ways there, but measuring food can be really illuminating in this regard. Nate, can you talk about that? Cause I know you've gone through the process of measuring food before trying to find a balance and let's kind of work our way toward finding the ideal caloric balance. Like he's talking about for cyclists. Yeah. Um, so I did for a while and, uh, it helped me lose some weight and change my body comp, but now I kind of, uh, I don't, I never do it anymore. And I just eat to hunger and just focus on the types of foods. And the biggest thing for me was realizing how little carbs I was eating and how much fat I was eating, which I know the keto people, but I was right in the middle. Like it wasn't, I wasn't ketosis, but I wasn't high carb either. And I find that I do the best and I have the best body count. What I do lower amounts of fat and I still get plenty of fat and then high carb. Um, so that's helped with that. The, the question, is there any research out there that supports a level of caloric surplus required to see optimum performance gains? So a caloric surplus will mean weight gain, but we're, we're what for you, um, Joe, what I think what happened with you is you lost weight and you lost muscle mass and that muscle mass loss resulted in a lower FTP. So for you, it sounds like if you have a caloric surplus in your training and you can gain that back in muscle, you're going to have that higher FTP, the higher watt per kg too, at the same time. And hopefully then there, there will be a time where no more muscle mass makes you any faster for mm -hmm. aerobic endurance, right? There's not, you're not going to be like a freaking bodybuilder with huge legs and like, just keep getting faster and faster and faster. That balance, who knows where it is for everybody, but I think it naturally happens when you, uh, when you eat to hunger and you, um, focus on those healthy foods and you train a bunch, your legs get to the size that makes you as fast as possible. The other thing you can do though, is you can add weight training and what weight training you can also do is this thing called body recomp. So this often gets confused. Um, the difference between weight gain and loss and fat gain and fat loss. So you can maintain the same weight and you can, um, so meaning you have the same caloric, you burn as much as you take in, but through weight training, you can change your body comp where you have more muscle and less body fat. I think everybody wants that, right? Um, to a certain extent, the problem is, is when you chase it down to the to the really low digits. And I think at 13, you're probably great. 43 male at 13, that sounds super duper healthy. Um, at 43, I would do some weight training and maybe that body couple switch a little bit. That's a great way too to increase your, um, uh, your, your, uh, muscle mass, which will probably also help with your FTP, especially since you just lost weight, gain that weight back. Um, and then man, you could play around it if you want to, this is really, really splitting hairs, but you could try gaining more weight. Um, but I, I wouldn't worry about it. I just wouldn't focus on losing weight now, especially cause you know, you go below 172 and you're a worse racer, like mm -hmm. you're a worse rider. And this, this question is so good for everyone to hear. I mean, okay. How many people here have focused on losing weight and just stagnated their performance for like six months? Oh, they didn't yeah. get any faster. They didn't get any slower. And then all of us, or, or I mean, so maybe they got slower. Right. And you kind of lost that training time. Mm -hmm. Uh, that is that's no good. And it's hard. The mental energy to do that is incredibly hard. Um, this is different if you're, um, you know, uh, you're actually obese, like metric, that's a different thing. Right. Mm -hmm. But if you're down in these, you're a man and you're 13%, that is, that's really good. Like, Oh yeah. Especially at 43. I want to add an important point to this too. When you, so let's say you start out and, and just anecdotally, this is for me, this is not scientific. This is just what I do, but I don't, I, if, when I'm trying to optimize and to shift body composition, I don't allow myself to have a deficit any larger than I, I always shoot for a hundred calories is basically where I shoot for, but anything larger than 200 would send alarm bells off for me. And I would not allow that to happen. So the, and because I could start off with 600 on Monday and feel fine on Tuesday. And then Wednesday, I probably feel fine. Thursday, I probably feel fine. Friday, I might start to feel something. And then the next week I'm in a hole. It's really easy because at first it won't feel bad and you'll actually reward yourself because for some reason, our brains love to reward ourselves for doing something with nothing for depriving ourselves, but still somehow performing. So we'll do that. And then you'll feel like, oh, I'm doing a great job. Way to go. Keep going. Maybe even drive it deeper. And then it doesn't take long. Eventually you'll feel the impact of that. 
And then it's really hard to get yourself properly nourished to the point where you can maintain a good training schedule again. So this is when you're talking about caloric deficits, don't be looking at crazy high numbers, shoot small, and then measure that impact over a month and see what that ha- see what happens there. Like when you're talking about surpluses, you don't have to be the gym bro that's going to go eat like 17 McChickens and 14 Big Macs, right? You don't have to do that. Like instead, you can do something much more measured and reasonable and you can search, try to go for 200, right? Somewhere within that range and then see what the impact is over time. And one really important thing that I heard Nate mentioned there is that if you want to rebuild lost muscle, the big question is people have, well, how do I gain muscle without doing that? And the answer is through fueling yourself with nutritious foods and making sure that you're training. And if you're fueling yourself with adequate nutrition uh, in terms of amount, but then also in terms of quality, then you get there. I know Pete, you've you're, you've preached that for a long time on the quality side of things. And you actually yeah. mentioned that even with that helps you with portion control. Yeah. And I think this, one of the things that, um, everybody's kind of touched on so far is that coming up with a magical number that is going to make you faster does not work at all. It worked for everybody listening. What you do is you start with where you are and you cut off a little bit at a time because you are there for like, it's something your body's used to. It takes, it takes a while for your body to accommodate new nutrition and change of habits and things like that. Um, so you don't just pick a number out of thin air and say, I'm going to do ne- minus 500 calories for the day. You're going to say, I'm going to eat a hundred calories less. I mean, th- it depends on the person and how your training is going, but you want your training to stay very valuable and to actually impact your overall performance. And then you start cutting off a little bit at a time and you're, you're taking these really small steps and that's the sustainable way over time and over weeks and months you're going to get to where you want to be and your body will be in a happier place and your mentally you'll be in a happier place. You'll be able to sleep all the things that actually go along and help you train in the long run. Um, but yeah, just like John said, the, if I eat more healthy food, my calories actually go down a little bit and my overall, uh, everything goes up. So it's, it's a, it's a kind of a hack just to eat more vegetables. If you eat more vegetables, you're going to eat less calories. You're going to feel fuller and you're going to, um, probably increase performance. It's, it's really easy. And, uh, where your goal weight is might not be what your fastest at. Yeah. Right. That is, that is so key. And a lot of us think of that. So I, I raced, I was like 180 at Leadville. I'm at 192 now, and I'm faster at 192 and Watts and power through weight at six, six rather than at 180, which is crazy. <laughs> right. Um, which is awesome too, because I like being bigger. And at 1866, it, like you look very small. Um, I know some people. You can be very. You some people my height can be that weight and be extremely fast. But for me, with my current lifestyle, the heavier weight's better. And with this advice too, this is for people I would say that are have a healthy body composition, a healthy weight. Um, if you are obese, I would talk to your doctor and try to get that. Uh, get the weight down faster than hundred calories per day, because that is impacting your health. I think of Jesse, um, we have articles about it too, about Jesse's experience, one of our employees. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it takes a long time to lose 200 pounds on hundred yes, calories correct. a day. Yeah. 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 That's and a spe- different situation. Yeah. Speaking yeah, chasing to those- performance, right. Is much yeah. different than, uh, than regaining health. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also it can just be really illuminating. If you're listening to this and thinking, and you've been thinking, I want to maintain a caloric deficit. So what, how much should I maintain? Just start by measuring and figuring that out first. Uh, well, first ask yourself why, like Ivy asks all the time, which is great. She start with why. And if you really don't need to lose that weight, then don't do it. Um, if you do uh, need to lose that weight, then do it, like find the why behind it. But then thereafter, once you've established that, just start by measuring. And that's really like Nate mentioned. And honestly, I feel like Pete, I think you've mentioned this before that in and of itself can be sufficient for people. You don't have to measure everything you eat every day. If you just measure for a a, a short period of time, it'll be illuminating and you'll say, Oh, okay. I'm not eating enough. I'm eating too much. Or it's really one-sided. I have a ton of fat. When I eat a lot of fat calories go up and it's really hard for me to feel full because I just don't get to eat a lot of food. If I hit those numbers. So it's just really helpful to be able to get to that point. I, I eat a ton of vegetables and I, we go through so many of them at, at our house, but I eat a ton of vegetables and I, I never, I don't feel hungry. Like I never get to that point, but it's also, I, I consume a huge volume of food, 
to be able to get to the numbers that I'm hitting. And the cool part is when I'm eating that high quality food at that volume and getting so much value from it too, it makes a huge difference with my training. So instead of obsessing about the caloric deficit, I keep myself close to my range. I try to give myself sufficient food that I'm always making sure that I'm eating enough food to fuel myself unless I'm in these cut phases, which are very not dramatic of like, you know, hundred calories being what I would do. And in that case, I'm feeling myself, but I'm just giving myself high quality food. My training, absolutely direct correlation to my training being better. I'm able to go to the next workouts, feel fresher, feel more ready. It's just better. I have a, um, this is on the spot. So Pete, as I say this, I want you to do it because you have very good Pete. Talk about an easy, think about an easy vegetable dish you can make for dinner. Mm -hmm. Um, Pete's a very good cook. Um, Ivy, do you have one too? The best. I don't know if you're a good cook or not. No. Cause I was just, I was just, when Jonathan was saying that I was thinking about that. I was like, damn, I need to eat more vegetables. Um, no. but like sometimes like, and we talked about meal prep, I think it was last week or the week prior, but like Sometimes I don't have the bandwidth to like roast a big pan of like sweet potatoes yeah. and beets for the whole week. And then, and then I'm like in that moment and I'm like staring at like raw spinach and I'm like, boo, like there's definitely <laughs> something better than I can. Yeah. Here's what I've been doing. I take uh, little bags of broccoli You can get a big bag, but I like the individual ones. I put it directly frozen. This is frozen broccoli into the air fryer. And then in the air fryer, I put tons of garlic powder and onion powder on it, then salt. And I do 400 degrees for between 10 and 12, depending on how charred. And then you just kind of mix it up a couple times. It takes literally for me like 30 seconds to get that going. And then I get this like charred restaurant quality and the like savory, really good broccoli. And you can either add that to any other dish you're eating or eat it on the side. And it is, even my kids like it, which is, that's insane, right? If your kids <laughs> like it, yeah, <laughs> eating broccoli. But that is so quick and so easy to do. But the key is, I don't even put any oil on it, but it's the garlic powder and the onion powder and the salt that mm -hmm. makes it savory and delicious. Pete, do you have uh, one? Yeah. One of the things that I think everybody needs to realize is that food that tastes good is easy to eat at like a super basic level. So if your vegetables taste good, you're going to eat more of them and you're going to, you're going to keep eating them. So one of my go-tos is I use more or less any vegetable that's in the house. Um, like last, uh, usually I'll make a big pan of Brussels sprouts or broccoli or cabbage or something. And if you put onion and garlic in a pan with some oil and make them fragrant, and then you add, sometimes it's like, I'll add tahini for a little bit of fat and a little bit of maple syrup, like the smallest amount. But the idea is that then they taste good. And it tastes like restaurant vegetables that you get on the side. And then you can, you can really add anything to that or add that to anything and it tastes good. And then there's, you know, if you have beans or a lean protein, you can just put it on top and salt and pepper, and then you're good. Like you can actually just eat that. And you'll be surprised that if it tastes good, you don't mind eating healthy. So find something that like really strikes your palate, whether that's garlic salt, whether that's salsa, whether that's coconut milk, you know, like it doesn't matter what it is. It just matters that you want to eat it. And then you can get there by making it over and over again. Oh, chickpeas. Pete, you gave me like the, the chickpea uh, talk a while back. And, <laughs> and now I, that is my like quick, like emergency, like vegetable. Um, mm -hmm. I'll like, I love Buffalo chicken, like, buff like Buffalo Ooh, wings yeah. and like Buffalo flavor. Oh man, I would drink that sauce. It's so good. Same. Uh, but I um, mean, like, like a Buffalo chicken wrap, but with chickpeas and like, I don't need to heat them really or anything. Like mm -hmm, if I'm mm -hmm. like starving, like super easy, but I'm going to make a very bold public request for cooking with Pete. I'm going to do it publicly so that I can get the TR athletes to back me on this one because <laughs> otherwise it's just me, but we Cooking need show it. With Pete. Yeah. I love it. Just yeah. some TikTok like style. good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why not? If you, if you like that and you want to hear about that, let us know in the comments below on YouTube. Wait, if you want to I see cooking with Pete, what's the chickpea recipe? Is it just chickpeas or do you like roast them or do you air fry them? What do you do? Oh, he just told me that like, um, nutritionally chickpeas are like, oh yeah, what I need to be getting after. Um, but sometimes yeah. people like prep them differently, right, Pete? And those can taste yeah. delicious. So oh, yeah. here's the, here's my favorite chickpea recipe that I every I made it for Chad and Amaret the other night because and it's like the it's so easy. Everybody loves it. It tastes delicious. So you put uh, you chop a couple shallots and a couple cloves of garlic. You don't do anything. You just drop the cloves of garlic in there. You put two cans of chickpeas in a like a Pyrex baking sheet, and then you put maybe two cups of broth. 
and that's it, salt and pepper, and that's it. And then you put it in the oven and it's got kind of like a slurry on the bottom. And then halfway through, you add as much leafy greens as you possibly can stomach. So like there's, a, I usually add chard because you get a lot of health for a smaller amount, smaller amount. And so I can add like two heads of chard to this dish and then you leave it in the oven. It takes an hour to cook. You've done nothing other than put some things in a pan. And then honestly, the real difference is if you have some smoked paprika, just a little drizzle, it like makes it much more fuerte. Um, but uh, you can, it kind of softens everything and turns into like a mash. And so if you if you, if you want it to be like an appetizer, you can spread it on bread and it just tastes like you're in another country. It's amazing. Um, and then having it as like a side dish for anything, you can have a salad in that and you're going to feel like, it's got so much flavor. It's got deep, like real, uh, weight to it. So it feel like you're eating something tastes mm -hmm. good. Um, you can put it on pasta. You can do like anything you want. It always adds to the flavor. So, and it takes an hour, but you don't do anything. So it's pretty amazing. Pete, Pete you have a, a new high priority task after this podcast, <laughs> write that recipe down. And the, and as the comment on the forum post, what episode is this, John? This is episode 303. 303. Please write that down because I'm okay. going to make that maybe tonight. And I think Ooh. other people are going to want to hear it too. It's, it's, uh, it sounds delicious. It's shamelessly stolen from like a 10 year old Bon Appetit. Um, but I'll find the Bon Appetit recipe and then I'll say what I do. I, Cause I usually take a recipe that's kind of hard and I try to make it easier because life is busy and you don't have time to make Bon Appetit mm -hmm. meals every night. Um, so I'll take, I'll post the recipe and I'll say, this is what I do. And this is how it works out. Awesome. Amazing. You know, geez. <laughs> Cooking with Pete is a hit in the live chat right now, by the way. It is a yes, hit. So. Yes. <laughs> that sounds it's so totally self-serving. Like I need help. Like I'm <laughs> the only request we've been getting is hair nets for Pete. So uh for his long hair. <laughs> <Beard> so. <nets>. <laughs> <laughs> Just like and tie it around net. here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that would be amazing. So this is great. Uh, uh we'll 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 make that happen. Marketing team's probably already jotting down ideas and having a brainstorming meeting on this right now as we speak. So <laughs> exciting. Let's get into uh, Ian's question. He says, Hey, trainer road and guests. I'm an average cat four road crit racer and recently got dropped on a local hard group ride through. And he mentions a through and off style ride. So what he's talking about there is like, it's hard enough so that there were pace lines necessary at the front. Right. He says I looked into the data using trainer road and can see that at the point I got dropped, I pushed 584 Watts average. And he mentions that 7.2 watts per kilogram for 31 seconds with 816 watt max. So that's, that's hard. That's a lot of power right there. This happened about 50 minutes into a 30 or about 31 kilometers into the ride. And also worth mentioning, and Ian, I hope you're okay with this. I did some snooping on your account, but um, uh, I had to, to get more information on this. But uh, at this point you had an FTP of 314 watts. So. Uh, Ian says, I have a max three second power of 1,320 Watts. So generally my anaerobic power isn't a limiter over short efforts, but I also rarely train anything above four, around 400 Watts when following my current training plans. So my question is, should I train specifically for these in between, and he says in quotes, VO two style full on sprint efforts as they appear to be a weakness. For example, with 30 seconds at 200% with 60 seconds zone two recovery repeats, actually make me stronger over 30 seconds or are there better ways to go about making the adaptations I'm after? Thanks for all you do, uh, from Ian. So I went, I went deep into this. Okay. And this is another great, maybe misattribution has been the theme of this episode, right? Where we think it's one thing, but it's actually probably a host of other things. So this is really common. We, uh, hear this in the context of climbing. People think they're bad climbers. And it's because they get dropped on a climb because that's a more decisive moment. It's like more heavily weighted. And as a result, that's where things will show. However, in many cases, you probably had the fitness to stay on that climb. It's just everything you did leading up to that climb. And this is a very similar scenario. So we're going to show the anatomy of how Ian blew up and we're going to talk about it. Okay. So first, uh, Ian started off the ride with four minutes of attacks, creating 328 normalized power and 319 average power and peaking at 1031 Watts. So that's a really hard start to the ride considering as a 314 watt FTP then settled into a round sweet spot for a bit. That's what he averaged in terms of average power for sweet spot. And by a bit, I'm talking like 40 minutes. <laughs> so <laughs> he's, that's a very large portion. Uh, so, so first of all, and then he did uh, actually, before we get even further, in your mind, build this trainer road workout. 
a flurry of attacks for four minutes where you are averaging way over threshold all the way up to a thousand watts. And then you ride at 40 minutes at sweet spot. That already sounds like an absolutely brutal workout, right? Like really hard. Then if you look at this, he did 105% for nearly 17 minutes in terms of average power prior to blowing up. He did 127% for the final minute and then 185% for 30 seconds with a peak at 816 watts before he blew up. So, so Ian, that's why you blew up. It's not because your 30 second power is bad. <laughs> it's because of everything leading up to that. Right. Mm -hmm. So this is really common though, for us to do. I've, I've done this too, where I think, oh, well, what happened in the moment that I blew up was the reason that I blew up, but no, we're, we're the sum of the races parts leading into that moment. And that's what, what ends up deciding it. So the 30 second power isn't why you blew up. You were just racing super hard. That was a really hard effort in this group ride. Nate, do you, do you want to jump in on something? I'm looking at it now. He, for 103 minutes, he did normalized power of 305, uh, 314 NP. And then the last effort was, you know, he was doing, it was like 340. Like, I, I don't know if it was, that's the very last one, but it was huge way above his FTP. Right. And yeah. of course you're going to die. Of course. <laughs> that is like, yeah. that is an all out race. That is tough. Um, mm -hmm. probably got a pretty good, probably was pretty fun and went pretty hard, but, um, <laughs> yeah, I, it's, yeah, it's hard. Yes. You went like all out pretty much. Right. So if you find yourself in this situation where you're wondering why I blew up or why I got dropped, look at the moment, but then look at everything that happened before that moment. And, and make sure that you assign the proper or identify the proper context to be able to assign actionable items from that. Otherwise, you'll think that in this case, your 30 second power was the reason. So you're just going to go bury yourself in 30 second efforts. And that's not going to be what you actually need to work on. Um, so there's definitely a discussion that we could have on efficiency and pace lines. We've talked about that so many times and being efficient in a pace line is very key, but I figure we should probably talk about training for that in particular. And the one thing that we say regularly is that it's about training the energy systems that are being utilized on race day, not just replicating specific context. So in this case, it's not about training your 30 second power. Instead, it's about training the energy systems that you need to be able to support these sort of efforts in this context of racing. So like part one, you mentioned this, I'll actually kind of indirectly, Nate, but a, th a high threshold helps, right? So yeah, if, I, if I'm like seven Watts per kilo, but my FTP is 190 Watts, if I attack really hard and we're on a flat road against Nate, Nate's just not going to do anything because he's got a higher FTP. So a high threshold, number right one, that, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> a high Sorry. threshold matters, right? <laughs> like it's, it's You're extremely <laughs> important. Uh, for yeah. That. And to that, when you think about like focusing on that 30 second effort, that is the specialty kind of the. You can get some gains on it, but they're going to be, um, there's going to be a limit to it and it's not going to be as long-term you raise your threshold this whole time. And suddenly instead of that 7.2 Watts per kilo, it's 6.5 and it's a lot easier. But if you were like, for me, we talked about this, I, I need to do this, train my one minute power. Um, I have a really high one minute power relative, or at least I think I do. That's how I do well in races, never trained it but I'm not going to do one minute power for a very long time to try to raise that up because that's the way that I win, but I could do it eight weeks leading up to an a crit, right. And really kind of do that after I built this kind of base and build, got my threshold up really high. I can maintain a, a high part of it. And now I'm kind of like sharpen that knife of one kind of specific move for the kind of race thing, the race outcome that I want to do. That's great strategy, but I wouldn't want to focus on a whole year of, or, you know, a whole base or build of 30 second or one minute efforts mm -hmm. to get that up. Um, yeah. how many people here where you raise your FTP and you look back and your 30 second power that used to be is now like your five minute power. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah. It's in yeah. my, mm -hmm. geez, when I'm off the couch, my FTP is 189. And I, I, I did more of that for Leadville for like nine hours. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. yeah. And that was killing me before. That's just an example mm -hmm. of raising that threshold rather than trying to like kind of split hairs. I, I yeah. <laughs> and imagine, imagine riding in a pace line with your past self, like your past self would never want to ride with your future self because I the poles, myself. yeah, the poles would be way above threshold. Like when I'm riding with Pete at our local crits that we do, and it's super windy and we're doing these poles into wind. So it's necessarily high power. It's taking less out of Pete every time than it is taking out of me. 
that high threshold, especially because in a pace line, you don't get to decide really how hard you pedal as much as you're trying to maintain the pace of the group. Ideally, the speed stays consistent, right? So your power, when it goes to the front, you don't tell everybody doesn't say ride at, you know, X Watts, 400 Watts is what you need to do when you're on the front. Instead, it's just keep the pace consistent. You'll have more power output when you're at the front and then less power output when you're in back in line. But if it's a really high pace and that those poles at the front are way above your threshold, that's going to be tough. You can't control that. And that you can you just pull, it, just pedal less. Oh, that's just the thing to a certain extent, right? Like you shorten or lengthen your pulse. That's really how you do it instead oh, of making them harder. Yeah. Or you get dropped. That's the other thing no, too. No, If you get to the front, you don't have to maintain the same speed. I, so many people don't, they just slow down. Sure. But there's a difference there in that case. I'm probably, if it's because I'm running up against a physical limitation because I can't push any harder, I'm probably going to get dropped from that group because usually what ends up happening if you're in that pace line, right, Pete? And if I go to the front and the reason I'm not pulling hard or long is because I'm at my limit and it's too hard, then that group, if I slow the group down, it's going to reaccelerate. And then when I reattach on, it's going to take extra work. My time is limited. Like I have an expiration date in that group, in that pace line. But so like it, we're going to a headwind, somebody stronger than me, they're pulling at 27. I get to the front and I go, Ooh, I don't want to do a 30 second pull more than 400. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to hit 380 and I slow down the group. The group still stays and it's still good. I don't have to maintain that, that 27. To a certain extent, but you are going to get popped eventually if that happens. If no, it's, I, it's the opposite. I'll be less likely to get popped because I am more, um, I'm saving energy. No, no, no. I think you're missing the point. Pete, can you jump in on this? <clears throat> yeah, I think, I think we're talking about two different pace lines. <clears throat> Nate's yeah. pace line is he's one of the strongest guys and he can do whatever he want because no matter what happens, he's ready and capable. Um, where, uh, Ian is probably the slowest guy, or I'm not going to say the slowest guy. He's having trouble in the pace line he is in. And so he is going to have to make decisions like skipping poles. And if one of the problems is if you really have no extra bandwidth in the break or in the pace line, and it, someone comes around you fast while you're pulling, you have to reaccelerate so much that that's like a double match. You just burned, you pulled and you had to catch back onto the back. Um, and if you're in a pace line, it's not always a headwind, uh, right? Like, so it's going to change and you can make different decisions over the course of the time. I think like we, we did say, Ian could position himself better in the pace line to save more energy. Like if you start, if you want to start the ride um, and take it easy for the first minute or two minutes while you're on the front, um, your first five minutes of your race ride is going to be much different than if you, you know, you accidentally let someone on the front and they're just throttling it for the first five minutes. That's a much different scenario that you're working with already. And it's only five minutes in. Um, but I think like Nate said, you can go slower and it's up to the group to either allow it or not allow it. And I, I do think that the best option for most people is, and to make the least amount of people unhappy is take a short, fast pull, maintaining the speed and only do five seconds. If you're really having problems, do roll through and do five seconds and then come back and spend as much energy as you can getting back in the draft and getting small and, and being on the correct side of the wheels and stuff like that, because that's going to make the difference. And if everybody else is doing 30 second pulls, it doesn't matter. It matters that you're like keeping the group together and you're just doing as, as little as you can to not blow yourself up in five minutes. Yeah, this is, uh, that, those are really great tips on how to survive in a pace line if you're on the limit, right? Because we're talking about getting dropped and, and really being on the fringe and it's not about pulling harder or easier. It's just about varying the duration. And mm -hmm. honestly, if you're in a, if you're in a pace line and you're on your limit, but you are still maintaining the speed, you just pull through and off like instantly, like you don't spend any time at the front. If that's the case, the group probably isn't going to get upset at all. In that case, if you're maintaining pace, you're probably going to be able to stay in there. And if it's sustainable, then you'll be able to hold in. It's really when you get to the point, if you start trying to do poles that are too long or too hard, and then that has that cascading effect of shutting everything down, then that's when it gets really tough. So like physically speaking about like what's happening in a pace line, in most cases, you're talking about riding the doing over unders, right? Riding over your threshold for a short period of time, 
then for the rest of the time, you're hopefully riding under your threshold. Although I've been parts of plenty of baselines where that's not the case. Like, over, like over. yeah, over, overs, right? Like, <laughs> like put me in, like, if I ever tried to hold on the legions train, it would be like, just like anaerobic sprints followed by VO2 max. Right. And I would just completely explode after a little bit. So, but really what we're talking about there is, is, is lactate shuttling and reprocessing. And so if you want to talk about how to train for that specifically, it's about making sure that number one, without a strong aerobic base and of conditioning, you can't be very good at this sort of work because of the fact that you need lots of little mitochondria to be able to carry out this process. And that happens as you train more, right? So more aerobic conditioning means that you'll be more aerobically fit. And that's a good solid platform to be able to build up on top of, but over unders of varying different kinds. Yeah, absolutely. will help for this. And that's why you'll see like in the rolling road race plans or in any of the different plans that you'll have threshold work. That's going to be positioning you in spots where you have to produce a lot of lactate and then reprocess it. And you have to do so on uncomfortable timelines. And that's really the way that this works and it's how you get better at it. So physically speaking, that's kind of it. Um, one thing with this though, I can't think of a type of work that will more quickly expose a lack of proper fueling too. Like if you're on your limit, and then you have to ride at threshold and just be just above threshold, just below threshold and repeat that for a pace line, or maybe it's like 60 minutes. Oh my goodness. If you're low on fuel, that's going to feel absolutely impossible. So it's, it's definitely an important detail there. <clears throat> um, um, Nate, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I have a, a shopping list. So tahini, chard, chickpeas, shallots. I already have some garlic. Does that sound good, Pete? <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, uh, the, yes, that works. Okay, great. The, the yeah. chat, I think everyone just, we'll just do a whole episode of just like cooking recipes. You just do live cooking. People love it. Yeah. We'll just do Podcast. it live. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, John. That's what, that's it. easy for you. Just do it live. John can like, I need the it. visuals. Yeah. It'll be fantastic. We'll do <laughs> it. Pete just walks around the kitchen and cooks. I don't want to bring us off of cooking with Pete because it's awesome. And we should just keep talking about this, but I do want to mention one thing though, with these over under style workouts, it's really key to understand that when you're doing over unders, there's a goal that you're trying to reach with that. Like it's, it's working toward usually like peak aerobic uptake or something like that at the end of those sets. Like you're, you should be spending the latter portions of that at peak aerobic uptake. And that's where we're really stretching your limits. A baseline is not designed like that. They are not saying let's get to peak aerobic uptake guys and maintain that and hang out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's not like that. So even if you do all of this, if you jump into a pace line, that's above your limits, you're still not going to be prepared. Or if you pace really poorly leading up to that, or you're not being efficient within the group, you're still going to be unprepared. So it's, it's really not just about having, making sure that it's like, you must be this tall to ride this ride. And then like, everything's magical. You still have to understand where your limits are and then figure out how do I respect my limits within the context of this specific pace line right now. And there are plenty of times where I'm in a pace line where I realize, like, okay, well, actually, I have to keep my head up and on a swivel and be able to react right now. It's less about preserving energy and making sure I'm super diligent or I need to drive the pace. And sometimes it's I'm hanging on for dear life. So I need to optimize so much because my limits put me here. The pace line's asking me to rise to this occasion. So you really just have to be able to comprehend your limits in relation to that pace line and then be able to do it. Training matters but execution matters a lot for sure. So who's ready to race. Oh, I want to race so bad. Whenever we I do heard... these like deep tactics, I'm just like, oh, I want to race. I know. <laughs> yeah, it's good. What'd you hear? Uh, Pete? We, we need to harass rich for some local racing because Tuesday nights would, would make my week much happier. Yes, uh, I agree. So let's just all, let's all pick it in front of, or, uh, send emails to rich and say, yeah, we're ready. I Podcast listeners to, right now, we'll give out his, I'm just joking. Yeah. <laughs> do a vaccine passport. Like, yeah, I don't know what the CDC says, but outside, if we've all been vaccinated, that sounds like a okay thing, but I don't really know. For yeah, sure. I don't know either. Yeah. We just want it. That's what we know. We just want it. Yeah. We want to be safe. That's what I want to say. <laughs> we got a lot of live questions, but we're already long on time. So I'm going to save those actually for next week, sir. I shouldn't say next week's, but the next iteration of the you podcast. Teased. For the, I know, I'm sorry. Uh, for the next handful of weeks, by the way, the podcast will be uh, somewhat different than normal. Uh, we have uh, Chad's moving. Amber also uh, is going to be taking a short break from the podcast because she has a lot of important projects that she's working on right now. Uh, most important project, of course, is is creating the little one. So um, congratulations on that again, Amber. So she's got a lot going there. So we're going to have different 
guests and everything else, just like we had Iman last week and everything else. So stay tuned for a variety of different things on the podcast, including addressing the live questions that you submitted. Thanks for doing that. And please submit the questions that you have, especially the rapid fire ones, but any questions, whatever they may be, do so at trainerroad.com slash podcast. And we will be going through those questions every week, like we always do and putting together a list to cover for the next time. So head over to trainer road, go to trainerroadcom slash AT to sign up for the adaptive training close beta and get faster. We'll see you all next week. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks guys.